Good morning and or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are all coming from. Um, we already have a good number of people attending today, so it seems like we're in good shape to get started on time for today's important and interesting webinar. Uh, first, thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. And uh, thank you so much to our um, esteemed presenters who are here to present um, important and often unheard information about an aspect of US uh, colonialism and war crimes that, that, are, that often go unnoticed and undiscussed, but yet uh, urgently requires redress. Uh, today's webinar is organized by the National Lawyers Guild International Committee and the International Association Association of Democratic Lawyers. Um, in this context, I also want to highlight the role of the Hawaiian Kingdom Subcommittee of the International Committee of the National Lawyers Guild in uh, spearheading this work and in organizing today's webinar. And I also want to invite um, everyone who is joining today, especially if you're a member of the National Lawyers Guild, to get involved with the Hawaiian Kingdom Subcommittee. And um, you've registered for today's event. We have your email address. And uh, you know, if you're interested in getting involved with the subcommittee, we'll be sending an email out after this event is over with a link to the video recording. And we'd really love to hear from you if you're interested in getting involved. And if you're not already a member of the National Lawyers Guild or the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and you'd like to become a member, or if you'd like to work together with your uh, grassroots organizations and movements. So today's webinar will also be streaming live on Facebook. And after the event is over, we will also be placing it on YouTube as well as on the websites of the National Lawyers Guild International Committee and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. Um, just want to let everyone know to, that please feel free to put your questions in the chat or to use the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of the screen. And after the initial presentation from both of our panelists, we'll be reviewing your questions and um, giving our guests the opportunity to respond to these questions today. So before we get started, I just want to introduce the webinar and give a little background on the National Lawyers Guild's involvement in um, this very important issue. Hawaii um, has been a recognized sovereign and independent state since the 19th century. However, it has been under a prolonged military occupation by the United States for the past 127 years that has led to the commission of war crimes and human rights violations of unimaginable proportions. In 2019, the Hawaiian Council of Regency proclaimed the establishment of the Royal Commission of Inquiry, whose mandate is to investigate the commission of these war crimes and human rights violations in order to hold a count war criminals in accordance with international humanitarian law. And it, this is not the first time the National Lawyers Guild has taken a position on the US occupation of Hawaii. Uh, in fact, a resolution was adopted by the national body in, in 2020, and this was followed up on by a letter that was sent from the National Lawyers Guild to the, to the governor of the state of Hawaii calling upon the state of Hawaii and its county governments as the proxies of the United States to immediately comply with international humanitarian law while the United States continues its prolonged illegal occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom since 1893. And within this context, the NLG strongly condemned the prolonged illegal occupation of the Hawaiian island, condemned the unlawful presence and maintenance of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command with 118 military sites throughout the Hawaiian Islands, called for the United States to immediately comply with international humanitarian law and to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an occupied state, uh, called on the legal and human rights community to view the U.S. presence in the, in the Hawaiian Islands through the prism of international law, including condemning its illegal occupation and supporting the efforts of the Hawaiian Council of Regency and its efforts to seek resolution in accordance with international law. In that context, the NLG also called on UN member states and non-member states to not recognize this ongoing illegal occupation as lawful and not to render aid or assistance to this ongoing illegal occupation. So that's just a background on the position that the National Lawyers Guild has adopted, um, particularly through the leadership involvement and activism of um, 
Kiana Sai, who we'll be hearing from today, the Hawaiian Kingdom Subcommittee, and um, activists throughout Hawaii who have been uh, working to expose the, this ongoing occupation and uphold international law within this context. Before we get started and I introduce the two speakers who will be presenting today, I also want to draw attention to another effort that is being um, organized by the National Conference of Black Lawyers alongside the National Lawyers Guild and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. This is the International Commission of Inquiry into Systemic racist police violence against people of African descent in the United States. Um, there are 12 international commissioners and three weeks of hearings with attorneys, family members, and victims of police violence who will be speaking to create a comprehensive report for submission to the U.S. Human Rights Council on this urgent and important topic. And if you'd like to learn more about the work of the International Commission of Inquiry, to please visit our website at inquirycommission.org. Um, and organizational endorsements for this project are very much welcome. With that being said, and without further ado, I'd like to move on to our speakers. Now I'm going to introduce both of our speakers and provide their bios and uh, then turn it over to our first speaker. So our, our first speaker today is Professor Federico Lanzarini, a professor of international law at the University of Siena, Italy, Department of Political and International Sciences. He is also a professor at the LLM program in, international, in intercultural human rights of the St. Thomas University School of Law in Miami of the United States and professor of the Tulane Siena Summer School on International Law, Cultural Heritage and the Arts. He is a member of the, inter, of the editorial boards of the Italian Yearbook of International Law, of the Intercultural Human Rights Law Review and of the Cultural Heritage Law and Policy Series. Professor Lanzarini received his Doctor of Law degree from the University of Siena Italy and his PhD in international law from the University of Bari, Italy. Dr. Keanu Sai is a lecturer at the University of Hawaii and serves as Hawaiian Minister of the Interior, Minister of Foreign Affairs ad interim, and head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. He also served as agent for the Council of Regency at the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, the Netherlands, in Larson v. Hawaiian Kingdom, PCA case number 1999-01. Dr. Sai received his PhD and MAs in political science, specializing in international relations and public law from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, um, Professor Federico Lanzarini. Federico. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. And I would also like to sincerely thank the National Lawyers Guild and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers as well as my, my good friend, Dr. Keanu Sai, for offering me the opportunity to participate in this event, which I hope will represent another little step towards the recovery by the Hawaiian people of their self-determination and dignity as a free people. Uh, my presentation will cover, first of all, the issue uh, under international law of the continuity of the Hawaiian state, and then, uh, consequently, uh, the topic of the legitimacy of the establishment of the Council of Regency, as well as of its authority, and finally, the uh, legitimate legitimacy of the institution of the Commission of uh, the Royal Commission of Inquiry by the, the Council of Regency. Uh, about the continuity of the Hawaiian state according to contemporary international law. Uh, I would like to start from a very famous arbitration, which is very well known to all experts in international law, which is the uh, Island of Palmas arbitration dating back to 1928, uh, when Judge Huber expressed the principle according to which occupation of a territory by a foreign state cannot be considered lawful if it is not in line with the current rules of international law governing occupation itself, irrespective of whether or not it might be considered legitimate at the time when the territory concerned was occupied. The consequence of this is that belligerent occupation does not affect the continuity of the state and the governmental authority may be driven into exile or silenced in the exercise of the powers of the state thereby affected 
but it is settled that the powers themselves continue to exist. Of course, it's a quite old case, but this view was substantially confirmed much more recently by the International Court of Justice in its advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the separation of the Chagos Archipelago from Mauritius in 1965. And this advisory opinion was actually released on the 29th of February of 2019. And as you know very well, the International Court of Justice is the most important judicial authority in the context of international law. And so it is particularly notable that it has confirmed a position which was already taken almost one century ago. Starting from this premise, the main question which today we should ask ourselves is whether the principle just explained applies to the Hawaiian kingdom according to contemporary international law. In other words, we have to check, we have to ascertain whether today in light of the historical vicissitudes which have characterized the Hawaiian islands since 1893, the Hawaiian kingdom can actually be considered a state under international law. And to this purpose, two issues need to be investigated. First of all, whether the Hawaiian kingdom was a state at the time when it was militarily occupied by the United States of America on the 17th of January of 1893. And second, in the event that the solution to the first issue would be positive, we have to see whether the continuous occupation of Hawaii by the United States from 1893 to present times has led the Hawaiian kingdom to be extinguished as an independent state and consequently as a subject of international law. So let us proceed with the first question, which is whether the Hawaiian kingdom was a state at the time when it was militarily occupied by the United States on the 17th of January of 1893. Uh, it was acknowledged by the arbitral tribunal of the permanent court of arbitration in the Larsen case, which Charlotte has mentioned in her introduction, that in the 19th century, the Hawaiian kingdom existed as an independent state recognized as such by the United States of America, the United Kingdom and many other states including by exchanges of diplomatic or consular representatives and the conclusion of treaties. At the time of the American occupation, the Hawaiian kingdom fully satisfied the four elements of statehood prescribed by customary international law, which were later codified by the Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States in 1933. First, the Hawaiian kingdom had a permanent population. Second, it had a defined territory. Third, it possessed a government. And fourth, the capacity to enter into relations with other states. And this is confirmed by the fact that the Hawaiian kingdom became a full member of the Universal Post and Union on the 1st of January of 1882 and maintain more than a hundred legations and consulates throughout the world. Furthermore, the Hawaiian kingdom entered into extensive diplomatic and treaty relations with other states, including Austria, Hungary, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Spain, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, and the United States themselves. So, as regards our first question, it is unquestionable that in the 1890s, the Hawaiian kingdom was an independent state and consequently a subject of international law. This implied that its territorial sovereignty and internal affairs could not be legitimately violated by other states. So let us now proceed with the second issue. Once established that the Hawaiian kingdom was actually a state under international law, at the time when there was the military occupation by the United States of America in 1893, it is now necessary to determine whether the continuous occupation of Hawaii 
by the United States from 1893 to present times has led the Hawaiian kingdom to be extinguished as an independent state and consequently as a subject of international law. Uh, we have to admit that this issue is controversial. There are different ideas, different positions, and it is possible to consider this delicate issue according to different perspectives. Uh, as noted again by the arbitral tribunal established by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Larson case, in principle, the question in point might be addressed by means of a careful assessment carried out through having regard inter alia to the lapse of time since the annexation by the United States, the subsequent political, constitutional, and international developments, and relevant changes in international law since the 1890s. Unfortunately, as you know, the permanent court, the, the arbitral tribunal established by the permanent court of, the, of arbitration did not provide an answer to this question. In any event, uh, beyond those speculative argumentations and the consequential conjectures that might be developed depending on the different perspectives under which the issue in point could be addressed, in reality, there is an argument, a legal argument, which appears to overcome all the others. And this argument is that a long lasting and well established rule of international law exists, establishing that military occupation, irrespective of the length of its duration, cannot produce the effect of extinguishing the sovereignty and statehood of the occupied state. In fact, the validity of such a rule has not been affected by whatever changes occurred in international law since the 1890s. Consistently, as emphasized in, in another very famous arbitration in the context of international law, which is uh, the Affaire de la Dette Publique Ottomane, uh, in that case, the Swiss arbitrator, Eugene Borel in 1925, said that uh, the effects of the occupation of a territory by an occupying power before uh, peace is reestablished or in an event before the end uh, of the occupation itself, uh, these effects cannot produce the consequence of determining a change, uh, a transfer in the sovereignty. So the occupation by one occupying power of the territory of another country is simply a mere fact. There is a state of things which is essentially provisional and the authority of the occupying power cannot replace forever the, the, the sovereignty of the occupied country. This position, by the way, was confirmed among others by the US military tribunal at Nuremberg in 1948, holding that in belligerent occupation, the occupying power does not hold enemy territory by virtue of any legal right. On the contrary, it merely exercised a precarious and temporary actual control. More recently, uh, very famous scholars have noted that occupation does not affect sovereignty. The displaced, displaced sovereign loses possession of the occupied territory de facto, but it retains title by law as a matter of law. In this regard, as previously specified, this conclusion can in a way be influenced by the length of the occupation in time, because the prolongation of the occupation does not affect its uh, inherently temporary nature. It follows that, uh, precarious as it is, the sovereignty of the displaced sovereign over the occupied territory is not terminated by belligerent occupation. 
under international law, the transfer, the transfer of sovereignty cannot be considered as producing legal, uh, legal effects unless there is a treaty stipulated by the two parties concerning the transfer of sovereignty from the occupying power, occupying state to the, uh, from the occupied state to the occupying power. And of course, this treaty must be stipulated voluntarily by both parties. So in other words, the only form in which uh, a transfer of sovereignty can be effected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the seeding and the acquiring state. Such treaty may be the outcome of uh, peace negotiations or of a war or of any other circumstance. And such a conclusion corresponds to a universally recognized rule, which is endorsed by juries and confirmed by numerous rulings of international and national courts. As you know, the United States has taken possession of the territory of Hawaii exclusively through the fact of occupation and unilateral annexation without concluding any treaty with the Hawaiian kingdom. In addition, it appears that the annexation of the Hawaiian kingdom by the United States has taken place in contravention of the rule of estoppel. It is a, a technical term which is known by experts of international law. The meaning of the doctrine of estoppel is that uh, the legitimate, legitimate expectations of states induced by the conduct of another state are protected. And this is actually what happened as regards the situation of the Hawaiian kingdom. Uh, on the 18th of December of 1893, President Cleveland concluded with Queen Lili Wokalani a treaty by executive agreement, which obligated the president to restore the queen as the executive monarch and the queen thereafter to grant clemency to the insurgents. Such a treaty, which was never carried into effect by the United States, who have precluded exactly by virtue of the doctrine of estoppel, the United States from claiming to have acquired Hawaiian territory because the conclusion of this treaty had ev evidently induced in the Hawaiian kingdom the legitimate expectation that the sovereignty of the queen would have been restated, an expectation which was undoubtedly frustrated through the annexation. So, the conclusion uh, concerning uh, the issue that I'm dealing with at present is that according to a plain and correct interpretation of the relevant legal rules, the Hawaiian kingdom cannot be considered by virtue of the prolonged US occupation as distinguished as an independent state and the subject of international law. Despite the long and effective exercise of the attributes of government by the United States over the Hawaiian territory. In fact, in the event of illegal annexation, the legal existence of states is preserved from extinction for the reason that illegal occupation cannot of itself terminate statehood. And even though, as I previously said, the uh, arbitral tribunal established by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Larsen case did not provide an answer to the question of whether or not the Hawaiian Kingdom uh, can be considered a state according to contemporary international law. In practice, the possession of the attributes of statehood by the Hawaiian Kingdom was substantially confirmed by the arbitral tribunal itself because when it established, uh, in particular, when the arbitral tribunal was established, so it was actually the permanent court of arbitration, which when it established the arbitral tribunal for the Larson case had to get assured 
that one of the parties of the arbitration was a state, because this is a necessary precondition for its jurisdiction to exist. So in other words, it was necessary for the jurisdiction of the permanent court of arbitration to be exercised and consequently for establishing an arbitral tribunal that one of the parties was a state. And in the Latsen case, the, the, the permanent court of arbitration uh, decided that the Hawaiian kingdom was the state, was the party which could be defined as a state. While the claimant, Lance Paul Larsen, was a private entity. So the conclusion according to which the Hawaiian kingdom cannot be considered as having been extinguished as a state as a result of the American uh, occupation also allows to confirm that the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state has been under an interrupted belligerent occupation by the United States of America from the 17th of January of 1893 up to present times. This conclusion cannot be validly contested even by virtue of the hypothetical consideration according to which since the American occupation of Hawaii has not substantially involved the use of military force and has not encountered military resistance by the Hawaiian kingdom, it consequently could, could not be considered as belligerent, as a belligerent act. But this is not decisive according to uh, international humanitarian law because a territory is considered occupied when it is placed under the authority of the hostile army. And this is the only condition. The law on occupation applies to all cases of partial and total occupation, even if such occupation does not encounter armed resistance. So the essential ingredient for applicability of the law of occupation is the actual effective control exercised by the occupying forces. This is fully consistent with the, the most pertinent rules of international humanitarian law, especially the rule expressed in Article 42 of the regulations annexed it to the Hague Convention of Fort respecting the laws and customs of war on land of 1907 which affirms that the territory is considered occupied when it is actually placed under the authority of the hostile army. And the conclusion that I have just drawn is, so, is also consistent with more recent article two common to the four Geneva conventions of 1949, establishing that such conventions apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. And it is important to stress that this is a principle reflected in customary international law. Okay, uh, I'm very sorry, maybe you can hear some, some noise, but uh, this is a problem with uh, the so-called smart working when we present from home. Uh, unfortunately, I'm at home and I, I, ha I have my little children and it, at this time of the day, it's not easy to, 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 to force them to, to get silent. So I'm very sorry if they disturb your listening. Okay, so let us move to the second issue. Once we have ascertained that under international law, the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist as an independent state, it is now time to assess the legitimacy and powers of the Council of Regency. Uh, a Regency is to be considered a man, an individual, or a body of individuals entrusted with the vicarious government of a kingdom during the minority absence, insanity of other disability of the king. Therefore, it appears that in consideration of the current situation of the Hawaiian kingdom, 
A regency is the right body entitled to provisionally exercise the powers of the Hawaiian executive monarch in the absence of the king. An absence which forcibly continues at present due to the persistent situation of military occupation to which the Hawaiian territory is subjected. In legal terms, <clears throat> sorry, the legitimacy of the Hawaiian Council of Regency is grounded on Articles 32 and 33, <clears throat> sorry again, of the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution of 1864. In particular, Article 33 affirms that it shall be lawful for the king at any time when he may be about to absent himself from the kingdom to appoint a regent or council of regency who shall administer the government in his name. Uh, then, uh, of course, the, the, the article continues, but this is the important part for us. The Council of Regency was established by proclamation on the 28th of February of 1997 by virtue of the offices made vacant in the Cabinet Council on the basis of the doctrine of necessity. So the fact that the establishment of the Council of Regency was, was done on the basis of the doctrine of necessity uh, makes it legitimate, even though the Council of Regency, of course, was not uh, established by the king or the queen herself. And the application of the doctrine of necessity was justified by the absence of the monarch. It follows that the Council of Regency possesses the constitutional authority to temporarily exercise the royal powers of the Hawaiian kingdom. The Council of Regency is composed by de facto officers and is actually serving as the provisional government of the Hawaiian kingdom. And should the military occupation by the United States come to an end, it shall immediately convene the legislative assembly, which shall proceed to choose by ballot a regent of Council of Regency, who on his turn shall administer the government in the name of the king and exercise all the powers which are constitutionally vested in the king until it shall not be possible to nominate a monarch. Again, pursuant to Article 33 of the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution of 1864. So in light of what I have just said, particularly in consideration of the fact that under international law, the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist as an independent state, although subjected to a foreign occupation. And in light of the fact that the Council of Regency has been established consistently, consistently with the constitutional principles of the Hawaiian kingdom and as a consequence, possesses the legitimacy of temporarily exercise the functions of the king of the kingdom, it is possible to conclude that the regency actually has the authority to represent the Hawaiian kingdom as a state, which has been under a belligerent occupation by the US since the 17th of January of 1893. And this power of representation of which the Council of Regency is vested, uh, of course, extends both at the domestic and the international level. As previously ascertained, the Council of Regency effectively possesses the constitutional authority to temporarily exercise the, the royal powers of the Hawaiian kingdom and therefore has the authority to represent the Hawaiian kingdom as a state pending the American occupation up to the moment when it shall be possible to convene the legislative assembly pursuant to article 33 of the Hawaiian kingdom constitution. So in practice, 
The Council of Regency is exactly in the same position of a government of a state under military occupation and is vested with the rights and powers recognized to governments of occupied states in light of international humanitarian law. Of course, under a practical point of view, the rights and powers of the Council of Regency are limited by reason of the fact that the governmental authority of a government of a state under military occupation has been replaced by uh, the, the, the authority of the occupying power. But at the same time, the ousted government retains the functions and the duty to the extent possible of preserving order, protecting the rights and prerogatives of local people, and continuing to promote the relations between its people and foreign countries. In particular, in light of its position, the Council of Regency may, uh, to a certain extent, interact with the exercise of the authority by the occupying power. So in other words, the authority over the Hawaiian territory in light of the present situation of occupation uh, must be considered as being shared by the Council of Regency and the occupying power. Uh, the occupying power in particular under an international law has the obligation to take all the measures in his power to restore and ensure as far as possible public order and safety uh, while respecting unless absolutely prevented the laws enforcing the country. This is a particularly important point, okay? Because even though uh, we, we may assume that the, the, the main power is vested in the occupying authority, but at the same time, under international humanitarian law, there is an obligation to respect and apply, uh, of course, to the extent possible, the local laws which are enforced in the country. In fact, one of the main purposes of the international law of belligerent occupation is to protect the sovereign rights of the legitimate government of the occupied territory. And there is therefore obligation of, an occupying, of the occupying power in this regard, an obligation which continue to exist even when in this regard of the rules of international law, it claims to have annexed all or part of an occupied territory which is actually the situation of the Hawaiian kingdom. Uh, the, the consequence of what I have just said is that since the ousted government is the entity which represents the legitimate government of the occupied territory, it may legitimately attempt to influence the life in the occupied area uh, in the interest of in its nationals. Uh, and one way to accomplish such goal is to legislate for the occupied population. So in other words, even though, uh, again, there is a military occupation, the uh, occupied government retains the authority to legislate for the occupied population. So for its population. In fact, occupation law does not require an, ex an exclusive exercise of authority by the occupying power. On the contrary, it allows for authority to be shared, as I previously said, by the occupying power and the occupied government, provided that the former continues to bear the ultimate and overall responsibility for the occupied territory. And it is important to note that in light of this under international humanitarian law, when uh, an authority which represents the occupied states uh, 
adopts legislative acts. These acts are not divested of effects as regards the civilian population of the occupied territory. So uh, in more concrete terms concerning the Hawaiian kingdom, the acts proclaimed by the Council of Regency are not divested of effects as regards the civilian population of the Hawaiian island. To the point that these acts, these legislative instruments might even if the concrete circumstances of the case so allow apply retroactively at the end of the occupation, irrespective of whether or not they must be respected by the occupying power during the occupation itself. The only condition for the legitimacy of the legis legislative action exercised by the authority representing the occupied state is that its legislative acts do not disregard the rights and expectations of the local population. In other words, the legislative acts adopted by, uh, in the case of the Hawaiian kingdom by the council of regency must not undermine the rights and interests of the civilian population. This condition is very important and leads us to the third issue that I would like to present concerning the establishment by the Council of Regencies of the Royal Commission of Enquiry. In other words, in light of what I have said until now, uh, is the, was the establishment of the Royal Commission of Enquiry by the Council of Regency legitimate under international law? In order to answer to this final question, let us proceed in order. The Royal Commission of Enquiry was established by the Council of Regency on the 17th of April of 2019. And by the way, it was a commission established in a similar fashion to the United States proposal of establishing a commission of enquiry after the First World War to consider the culpability of the authors of the war, uh, of the war and the question of their culpability as to the violation of the laws and customs of war committed during its course. So there is a precedent. And even though uh, at the end of uh, the First World War, uh, this proposal was not realized. Uh, what is important to emphasize when it comes to the, the Royal Commission of Enquiry of the Hawaiian Kingdom is that in the proclamation establishing the commission, we may read that its purpose shall be to investigate the consequences of the United States belligerent occupation. Now I'm quoting, including with regard to international law, humanitarian law and human rights and the allegations of war crimes committed in that context. The geographical scope and time span of the investigation will be sufficiently broad and be determined by the head of the Royal Commission. So basically this sentence illustrates the mandate of the Royal Commission of Enquiry. Its competence is therefore to ascertain whether there have been violations of human rights and international humanitarian law uh, during the whole period of the belligerent occupation by the United States uh, to the prejudice of the Hawaiian population. So let us remember uh, the main condition that I explained uh, concerning the legitimacy of the legislative acts adopted by an authority like the Council of Regency, which represents the occupied people. You will remember that this condition is that these legislative instruments uh, do not prejudice uh, the rights of interest of the local population. Okay, in the case 
of the proclamation establishing the Royal Commission of Equity, of course, it does in no way undermine the rights and interests of the civilian population. On the contrary, its purpose is exactly to protect such rights and interests. For the reason that the commission, through establishing whether violations of human rights and or international humanitarian law have been committed during the US occupation, would establish the factual basis for the victims to obtain justice, possibly even through access to reparations, even though at the moment it is not possible to foresee whether or not this situation will be actually realized in practice in the future. So in simple words, the purpose of the uh, Commission of Equity is to make something corresponding to the interest to the realization of the rights of the local population. Okay, uh, this is particularly important. Again, the clear purpose of the work of the Commission of, An of Inquiry is to ensure the protection of the Hawaiian territory and the people residing therein against the prejudicial effects which may have resulted from the occupation to which the Hawaiian territory is presently subjected since the 19th century. So the proclamation establishing the Royal Commission of, uh, the Royal Commission of Inquiry is a legislative act aimed at furthering the interest of the civilian population through ensuring the correct administration of the rights and of the land. As a consequence, this proclamation has the nature of an act that is equivalent in its rationale and purposes to a piece of legislation concerning matters of personal status of the local population, which under international humanitarian law, the occupant has a duty to respect and to give effect to it. It is also important to stress that at the same time, in addition of trying to uh, promote the interest of the local population, the proclamation establishing the commission of inquiry does in no way affect the rights and powers of the occupying power because under international humanitarian law, it is beyond any doubts that the occupying power is bound to guarantee and protect the human rights of the local population and to respect international humanitarian law itself as defined by the international human rights treaties of which a state is a party, but also beyond treaties, these rules are established by international, customary international law as well. And this has been again authoritatively confirmed among others by the International Court of Justice. So in reality, the proclamation of the Commission of Inquiry has the purpose of give realization to a value, which also the occupying power has an international obligation to realize, an international obligation to respect. So uh, the conclusion is that the proclamation certainly does not undermine or significantly significantly interfere with the exercise of the authority of the occupying power. On the contrary, maybe it favors the exercise of the duties, the compliance by the occupying power with its, its own duties. And so certainly the conclusion is that the uh, proclamation by the Council of Regency establishing the Commission of Inquiry is fully consistent with existing international law and the existing international obligations of both parties. It follows that the occupying power cannot be considered uh, absolutely prevented from recognizing the legitimacy and eventually applying the proclamation of the Council of Regency establishing the Royal Commission of Inquiry as a piece of domestic legislation protecting the human rights of the local population. On the contrary, the uh, 
US administration as regards the Hawaiian territory has a duty to favor under international law again, as a duty to favor the work of the Royal Commission of Enquiry. Again, because its purpose is to give realization to a value that is the protection of human rights and compliance with international humanitarian law that the, the, the occupying power has a duty to respect as well. And so the conclusion is that, and I have reached my, the, the, the general conclusion of my speech is that uh, there is continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom under international law. That the position of the Council of Regency is perfectly legitimate because the Hawaiian kingdom had the right under international law to establish an authority, a body representing the uh, legitimate government of the territory. And third, that the institution of the Royal Commission of Enquiry by the Council of Regency is perfect, perfectly legitimate as well for the reason that uh, has the purpose to protect the interest and the rights of the local population and its work does in a way interfere with the uh, exercise of authority by the occupying power. On the contrary, uh, it, it may help uh, the occupying power in exercising its authority. So having said that, the hope now is that the work of the Royal Commission of Enquiry will start to produce its fruits as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, I apologize if you have heard any uh, noise and disturbance during my speech. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Federico. Thank you, Professor Lanzarini, um, for your insightful and extensive analysis. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to the next speaker for today, uh, Dr. Keanu Sai. Keanu? Aloha mai kako, as we say uh, in the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, it's pretty sunny here. Uh, we're looking at just before 11 o'clock, but I noticed that we have people who are attending this webinar um, are coming in from all over the world. So I just want to give a greetings out to, uh, uh, to everyone. Aloha. Uh, what I'm going to do is do a share screen and I'm going to be doing a PowerPoint. And my topic for this webinar will be the mandate of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. Uh, Professor uh, Federico Lanzarini has provided uh, the basis or the foundation as to why I now can speak to that mandate, uh, get into the particulars. But what I also want to do before we get into the specificity of the mandate itself, a brief history of Hawaii that got us to where we are, which would overlap with some of what Professor Lanzarini had provided. Yeah. So. When we talk about the legal status of the Hawaiian kingdom, right? As Professor Lenz really pointed out, the permanent court of arbitration in the, stated uh, through its arbitral tribunal that in the 19th century, the Hawaiian kingdom existed as an independent state recognized as such by the United States of America, the United Kingdom and various other states. In 1893, there were only 44 independent states in what was called the family of nations. This is uh, very important to note because Hawaii was part of a small group of states in the 19th century, but more so it was a non-European state. Uh, today, membership at the United Nations comprised of states themselves, a number I believe uh, 193, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, most of them became independent states through what is called decolonization and the exercise of self-determination. For Hawaii though, we are not trying to achieve decolonization from the United States, but rather we are a state as has been a state since the 19th century, but currently under occupation. Self-determination in this sense, very different from a colonial situation, is that as an independent state under occupation, the realization of self-determination is when the occupation of the state comes to an end. Also the Hawaiian kingdom in the 19th century was a recognized neutral state by treaty along with Belgium, Luxembourg and Switzerland. 
In the 1849 Hawaiian American Treaty, Article I specifically states there shall be perpetual peace and amity between the United States and the King of the Hawaiian Islands, his heirs and his successors. Now this point here of heirs and successors do not apply to the lineal descendants of the king, but rather the successor monarchs of the king, the last of which was Queen Lili Wokalani. She would be considered under this treaty a successor to, at that time, King Kamehameha III. Importantly stated in Article 8, says that, and each of the two contracting parties engages that the citizens or subjects of the other residing in their respective states shall enjoy their property and personal security in as full and ample manner as their own citizens or subjects, but subject always to the laws and statutes of the two countries respectively. This is the United States acknowledgement of Hawaii as an independent state, which means its independence includes its laws, its custom, its administrative policies that apply over Hawaiian territory to the exclusion of those laws, those customs, and those administrative practices over the United States territory. So when Hawaiian subjects in the 19th century travel to San Francisco, they are subject to United States law and the laws of California. For American citizens residing in the Hawaiian kingdom, they are subject to Hawaiian kingdom law, not the laws of the United States. Now, Judge Greenwood, he stated that traditional international law was based upon a rigid distinction between the state of peace and the state of war. Countries were either in a state of peace or in a state of war. There was no middle ground. There was no intermediate state. Acts of war triggers state of war. And state of war includes the law of belligerent occupation. By direction of Hawaii's Queen Lili Okalani, President Grover Cleveland in March of 1893 initiated the investigation of the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government on January 17th, 1893. On December 18th, 11 months later, the president reported to the Congress his findings and conclusions of the investigation. He stated to the Congress on the 16th day of January, 1893, between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, a detachment of Marines from the United States steamer Boston with two pieces of artillery landed at Honolulu. The men, upwards of 160 in all, were supplied with double cartridge belts filled with ammunition and with haversacks and canteens, and were accompanied by a hospital corps with stretchers and medical supplies. The president then concluded this military demonstration upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. President Cleveland also stated that the government of the queen was undisputed and was both the de facto, in fact, and the de jure in law government. When our, when our minister, he stated, recognized the provisional government, the only basis upon which it rested was the fact that the committee of safety, these insurgents, had in the manner above declared it to exist. He concluded it was neither a government de facto nor de jure, but rather an insurgency. Then President Cleveland also concluded that by an act of war with the participation of a diplomatic representative of the United States and without authority of Congress, the government of a feeble but friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. And that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States, thus triggering international humanitarian law. These acts of war committed by the United States triggered a state of war with the Hawaiian kingdom and the application of the law of occupation. On December 18th, as mentioned by Professor Lenzerini, the same day of Cleveland's message to the Congress, back in Honolulu, as a result of diplomacy between the US minister Albert Willis and Queen Lili Okalani at the US legation, after months of negotiation, the queen agreed to the conditions of granting amnesty to the insurgents after she is restored. 
International law calls this type of an agreement an executive agreement by exchange of notes, which is recognized as a treaty. Annexationists in the Congress, however, blocked Cleveland from restoring the queen that consequently left the insurgents without amnesty and therefore fugitives of the law. Under this treaty, the United States admits that the members of the provisional government were never a government, but rather insurgents. Professor Lanzarini's mention of the doctrine of estoppel speaks directly to this. When the, in this treaty or agreement, the United States president committed the United States in accepting the fact that what happened in Hawaii was illegal and that the United States was directly tied to it. And then by accepting the facts, negotiated with the queen and was able to get the queen to agree to grant amnesty after she is restored. But that obligation of restoration was not carried out by President Cleveland. Nevertheless, this treaty or executive agreement itself is what precludes the United States from claiming to have annexed Hawaii in 1898. Now, what is important in international relations and international law is that there is a distinction between what is called the state, which Professor Lanzarini addressed in his presentation, the first issue, the state or the subject of international law. Well, Hawaii, it was granted its independence by Great Britain back on November 28, 1843. Okay. Now that sovereignty, that state sovereignty was exercised by a government. Now a government is not the state and a state is not the government. Governments are subject to the domestic laws of the country itself, whereas the state is subject to international law. Okay. Now, in this particular case of international relations, when two states engage in armed conflict, whether one resists or not, but the outcome is the overthrow of a government, as was the case in Hawaii, that overthrow of the government does not extinguish the state. The state would still exist as a subject of international law and thereby trigger, international law triggers the law of occupation when the occupying power is in effective control of territory. Okay? So an invasion of the Hawaiian kingdom on January 16, 1893, as admitted by President Cleveland, did not trigger the law of occupation. It was the next day, January 17, 1893, when the queen yielded and surrendered her authority temporarily to the United States to investigate the actions taken by the US ambassador is when effective control was acquired by the United States and then it would be applied to its proxy, the provisional government. So an invading force does not trigger the law of occupation. As Professor Lanzarini mentioned, it is the effective control of the territory under Article 42 of the Hague Convention that triggers the law of occupation, which is Article 43, to administer the laws of the occupied state. Now, at that time in 1893, the Hague Convention of 1907 did not exist, but it is recognized that the Hague Convention is merely codification of customary international law that existed before the treaty. Okay, so the 1899 uh, Hague Convention, later superseded by the 1907 Hague Convention, were merely codifications of what was accepted as customary international law regarding occupation. So what was that customary international law in 1893? Well, that customary practice was for the occupying state to administer the laws of the occupied state, in this case, in this case the Hawaiian Kingdom, and not the laws of the occupier or the United States when they are in effective control of the territory. This obligation is now codified under Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Regulations and Article 64 of the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention. The US did not administer Hawaiian Kingdom law and instead unilaterally annexed the Hawaiian Islands in 1898 during the Spanish-American War. Now at this point, I need to clarify and discern the two terms of what is called ceded territory or cession of territory that is done between the occupied state and the occupying state, as opposed to annexation. Annexation 
as opposed to session, is a unilateral act, one-sided, to attach something, to grab something. Session is to convey something, right? So in the case of the Hawaiian Kingdom, in 1898, during the Spanish-American War, the United States did not acquire any territory from the government of the occupied state being the Hawaiian Kingdom. They merely declared their annexation of the Hawaiian Islands by a joint resolution. Now, this is how cession of territory is supposed to take place, so the transfer of territory. According to Professor Oppenheim, he states that the cession of state territory is the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a cession can be affected is an agreement in a body between the ceding and the acquiring state. So here we have two sovereign entities, two sovereign states, subjects of international law, represented by two governments. One government will cede territory to another during a state of peace or cede territory during a state of war. Well, here is the United States of America, and this shows how the United States acquired majority of its territory, not through discovery. They acquired it from other states. The first transfer or cession of territory came from the French in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. Prior to 1803, that territory there was subject to French law enacted by the French legislative body in Paris, right? This would be considered an extension of France in a colonial capacity. Later, in 1819, the Spanish transferred the area we know today as Florida to the United States by a treaty. Again, this was during a state of peace, like the Louisiana Purchase. And then in 1846, the British ceded territory today comprised of Washington and uh, Oregon, and I believe Idaho, in 1846, all negotiated during a state of peace. But the United States has an example of acquiring territory from an occupied state as a result of ending the war. And that was a treaty of peace called the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that transferred all prior Mexican territory north of the Rio Grande to the United States. Prior to 1848, the territory north of the Rio Grande was subject to Spanish law. After 1848, at the conclusion of the treaty, the United States law was applied over that territory. So what is the authority of Hawaii session? How did the United States acquire Hawaii, an independent state? Well, it was a joint resolution of annexation. A joint resolution is a resolution agreed upon by both Senate and the House of Representatives and signed into American law by the president at this time, William McKinley. The problem is this is a municipal law of the United States. This is not a treaty. So this is not a source of, you, of international law, which governs and regulates occupations. This is an American law, very similar to the 1990 proclamation of annexing Kuwait by Saddam Hussein's Iraqi government out of Baghdad. That was an internal law of Iraq that had no effect over Kuwaiti territory as an occupied state. Now in the congressional records, Senator William Allen clearly articulated among many other senators and representatives, the limitation of the US constitution and its laws. He stated on the record, the constitution and the statutes are territorial in their operation. That is, they cannot have any binding force or operation beyond the territorial limits of the government in which they are promulgated. In other words, the constitution and statutes cannot reach across the territorial boundaries of the United States into the territorial domain of another government and affect that government or persons or property therein. And he also stated in 1900, when they were debating, enacting what is called the Territorial Act, right? Called the Territorial Hawaii, they're gonna change the name of the Republic of Hawaii, their insurgency. He, sp he blatantly stated the joint resolution is ipso facto null and void. So a joint resolution does not have the ability to extend beyond the borders of the United States. There is no argument 
to even say that. But rather, a joint resolution is an American law that is limited to the United States in its effect. And it has no effect outside of US territory. What well, this was the uh, uh, Congressional Act that changed the name of the Republic of Hawaii, so-called Republic, to the territory of Hawaii. Again, an American law, now called an act, not a joint resolution. And this was followed in 1959, the United States Congress passed another law, changing the name of the territory of Hawaii to the state of Hawaii. Again, it's an internal law of the United States. And then in 1993, the United States passes a joint resolution like the joint resolution of annexation, but both are limited to US territory. This joint resolution apologizes for the illegal overthrow of what took place, the illegality of what took place on a part of the United States in 1893. But this joint resolution began to fan the fire or the, uh, the embers of pushing a false narrative that native Hawaiians are indigenous people within the United States that have a right to self-determination. Uh, self-determination applies in the territory that is occupied to the people when occupation ends. It doesn't apply as this resolution implies that native Hawaiians could be in a colonial context. It wasn't. It was a means to obfuscate or confuse and blur what actually took place. So what does the United States Supreme Court say regarding all of these municipal laws? Well, United States versus Curtis Wright Export Corporation, the United States Supreme Court stated, neither the constitution nor the laws passed in pursuant of it have any force in foreign territory. And operations of the nation in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law, which is precisely what you heard from Professor Lanzarini and what you are hearing from me in this presentation, because it is through international understandings and compacts and the principles of international law that can bring the issue of Hawaii out in its proper context as a state that is belligerently occupied. Now, why is it that we don't know this information? People say, why hasn't, haven't this, why hasn't this information come out a long time ago. Well, Hawaii's population and by extension, the international community has been affected by what is called a formal policy of denationalization that took place in the early 1900s once America began to develop the, United, the, the Hawaiian kingdom into appearing that it's part of the United States and the establishment of Pearl Harbor. This would take place formally in 1906, but it goes back to 1895. And I wanna draw attention to what this insurgent said, Samuel Damon. Now, Samuel Damon is not an American citizen. He was a Hawaiian subject, right? His parents were American citizens, but they were naturalized under Hawaiian law, missionaries. This man was a Hawaiian subject, not an American citizen, but more so this man was an insurgent. On the record, in that so-called Republic of Hawaii cabinet meeting. He specifically stated, if we are ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past. Denationalization is to obliterate the national consciousness of the occupied state in the minds of the local population. In 1906, a pamphlet titled Program for Patriotic Exercises in the Public Schools was published by the government of the territory of Hawaii. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of the Hawaiian uh, Islands to be American and to speak English. A reporter from Harper's Weekly Magazine out of New York traveled to Hawaii and visited three schools, Ka'iolani Public School that went from grade one through through uh, eighth grade, I believe, Kahumanu Public School, grade one through eight, and Honolulu High School, okay, which later changed its name to President William McKinley High School. Well, when the reporter went to Kaiolani Public School, six, 614 school children at the order of the principal were ordered to march 
They lined up in front of the flag and at the command of the principal, as it states at the bottom of this caption of this picture, uh, we give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. This scene shows a salute to the American flag, which flies in the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese pupils. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. That term inculcate means to brainwash through repetition, okay? Now this generation here that have been led to believe they're Americans and that Hawaii is now a part of the United States, this generation is my grandparents' generation. By the time it got to my parents' generation, my dad was born in 1939. In school that he attended, St. Louis, it's already in institutionalized. By the time it got to me, and I was born in 1964, when I attended schools to include the Kamehameha schools, we had no information about Hawaii being its own country. Instead, we were led to believe that Hawaii and its people wanted to be a part of the United States. This was what you might say being victims of denationalization. But more seriously, this term denationalization and the implementation or policy of denationalization is a war crime. In 1919, denationalization was listed as a war crime as attempts to denationalize the inhabitants of occupied territory. This would be applied retroactively to World War I, which ended in 1918. Now, how could they come up with the war crime one year after the war and try to apply it you know, retroactively? Well, what they stated here was that their position was that these war crimes that they identify, one of which is attempts to denationalize, are actually war crimes under customary international law, meaning it was there already. They're just drawing attention to it. Therefore, it would apply since 1893 in the case of Hawaii. Now, stemming from Italy's occupation in the Second World War, Yugoslav Charge 1434 stated, Apart from killing, deporting, and interning innocent persons, the Italians started a policy on a vast scale of denationalization. As part of such policy, they started a system of re-education of Yugoslav children. This re-education consisted of forbidding children to use the Serbo-Croat language to sing Yugoslav songs and forcing them to salute in a fascist way. When you apply this, fact to Hawaii, what only lasted from 1914 to 1918 attempts to denationalize. In Hawaii, it was, it was done unimpeded for over a century. As Donald James Will, also known as Dresden James, the British novelist once wrote, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. What is also important here, when we're looking at Hawaii's situation, number one, the state never ceased to exist. And its laws, its administrative policies, its common law, it still exists as part of the sovereignty of the Hawaiian kingdom. But what replaced the Hawaiian government in 1893 when Queen Lili Okalani surrendered conditionally to the United States president. She transferred effective control to the United States. Now international law as pointed out by Professor Lanzarini is that the effective control of Hawaiian territory by the United States and its proxies proxy since 1893 did not extinguish the legal status of the Hawaiian kingdom. It did it, right? As stated by Judge Crawford, pending a final settlement of the conflict belligerent occupation does not affect the continuity of the occupied state. The governmental authorities may be driven into exile or silenced and the exercise of the powers of the state thereby affected, but it is settled that the powers themselves continue to exist. This is strictly not, not an application of the actual independence rule, but exception to it. What is important here is the actual independence rule applies as to the cornerstone of 
sovereignty of a state. The state and its government has to be in effective control over its territory to maintain its legitimacy during a state of peace. But during a state of war, effectiveness does not create sovereignty. Actually, effectiveness triggers the law of occupation under international humanitarian law. So uh, Judge Crawford says that this is an exception to the rule of effective effectiveness in territory pending a settlement of the conflict by a peace treaty or its equivalent. That executive agreement is a peace treaty, but it wasn't carried out. Okay. So that means American law cannot be applied in Hawaiian territory in light of the fact that that treaty still exists, but it wasn't carried out, thus invoking the doctrine of estoppel or preclusion that precludes America from claiming anything outside of what it already admitted to, which is the illegality of its participation in the overthrow and that these individuals who are part of the insurgency were not a government, not a government. So what we had here in Hawaii, we had the state and its government apparatus. How could so few people take over an entire country? Well, basically it was as a result of US Marines protecting these insurgents, right? That's important. But how could so few take over an entire country? All that changed. In 1893, January 17th, was the removal or the forced removal of, the, of Queen Lili Okalani and her cabinet of ministers, four ministers, and the head of the police force, Marshal Charles Wilson. Everyone were forced to stay in place in government and to sign oaths of allegiance to this insurgency who were being protected by the United States military. So all you had here this governmental apparatus, which is the Hawaiian kingdom government, it was hijacked. So the names merely changed from the Hawaiian kingdom and a monarch as the chief executive to the so-called provisional government and a president. 1894 from a provisional government to a republic so-called and a president. And then from a so-called republic when the United States changed the name to the territory of Hawaii by its Congress. And then in 1959, the Congress again changed the name from the territory to the state of Hawaii. What you notice is the legislative, executive, and judicial branches pretty much stayed the same, but all they did was through denationalization, get those in part of the local population to believe that there was a valid transfer of sovereignty when there wasn't. The goal during occupation is to compel the state of Hawaii and its county governments to begin to comply with the law of occupation by proclaiming itself to be an occupying government recognizable under international law. Right now, the state of Hawaii is only recognizable under American law, that statehood act of 1959 that is limited to US territory. The problem is individuals in the state of Hawaii and the county governments are not in the United States territory, they're in the territory of the Hawaiian kingdom. Once they transform themselves into an occupying government, then it must begin to administer the laws of the occupied state and ultimately begin and prepare down the road, down the road for the transfer back to the Hawaiian kingdom government, right? So all we're looking at here is a change at the top, not at the bottom. And that's what's important to keep in mind. So restoring the Hawaiian government, as explained, Hawaiian kingdom, the Hawaiian kingdom as a state continues to exist, right? despite effective control by the occupier. The state still exists. What was done in 1996 was the restoration of the Hawaiian government by a council of regency within the parameters allowed by Hawaiian kingdom law and international humanitarian law that Professor Lanzarini had already covered. Addressing over a century of occupation, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was formed similar to the formation of governments in exile during the Second World War. The difference is we are not going to form a government in exile, but rather a government in situ, which means within the territory of the occupied state. In particular, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established in similar fashion to the Belgian Council of Regency after King Leopold was captured by the Nazis. As the Belgian Council of Regency was established under Article 82 of the Belgian Constitution of 18, 
21, the Hawaiian Consular Regency was established under Article 33 of the Hawaiian Constitution of 1864. When it was formed, it needed to establish a strategic plan to engage this very complex issue. And we are dealing back then in 1996 with people that have been completely denationalized. Well, to effectively address denationalization, but also to exercise the inherent authority of the Council of Regency under the doctrine of, on the doctrine of necessity in order to protect the rights of the local population three phases of its strategic plan. The first phase, verification of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state and subject of international law. We need an international body to verify, not recognize. This is verifying what international law has already preserved, but we need verification for people today to realize a reputable body confirmed or verified what international law has stated that the Hawaiian kingdom is a state. Once we get verification, then we move into phase two, exposure of this statehood within the framework of international law and the laws of occupation as it affects the realm of politics and economics at both the international and domestic levels. Phase two will focus on truth, but also accountability. But you can't hold people accountable if they're not aware or exposed to the facts. Phase three would be restoration of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state and a subject of international law. Now phase three is when the occupation comes to an end. In this process, the Council of Regency looks to two transitions. First, the first transition of governance will be to transform the state of Hawaii and the counties into an occupying government. As a direct successor of the insurgency, calling themselves the provisional government, the state of Hawaii is considered by definition under international law as an armed force, not a government. International law requires an armed force to be an occupying government in order to administer the laws of the occupied state when they are in effective control of the territory of the occupied state. The state of Hawaii can transform themselves into an occupying government by declaring under their provisions, their constitution, martial law, because the state of Hawaii and the counties are no doubt in effective control of territory of the Hawaiian kingdom and are obligated to administer the laws of the occupied state. Second transition will be to transform the occupying government which used to would be called the state of Hawaii or the county and the counties, transforming that government into the government of the Hawaiian kingdom when the occupation comes to an end through a new treaty of peace that provides for transition. Officials and employees of the occupying government will remain in their positions with the exception of the governor and his cabinet. Now, mind you, this is when occupation ends. This is not during the occupation. So this will be merely a reversal of what took place in 1893. And the governor and his cabinet will be replaced by the Council of Regency and its cabinet. And everyone in government will take the oath of allegiance in accordance with Hawaiian kingdom law. So what you have in this second transition is merely okay, a repetition of what happened in 1893, but reversed. That's all it is. Now, lawfare, lawfare, that term as distinguished from warfare is the util utilization of existing institutions and laws in order to achieve certain objectives during a belligerent occupation. The Council of Regency seeks specific objectives to ensure compliance with the law of occupation under the Hague and Geneva Conventions. The Council will implement its strategic plan through lawfare utilizing existing institutions and existing laws in order to bring compliance to the law of occupation. This was the only way that the Council of Regency uh, could find a way to implement its strategic plan given the lack of resources and manpower where we had to rely on existing institutions and laws and not create new institutions or promote new laws 
but rather what exists. So it's a very conservative approach with radical ramifications. This lawfare was done, this idea of lawfare was done at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration would be put in a position as stated by Professor Lanzarini, that in order to exercise its administrative jurisdiction to create an arbitral tribunal, one of the parties to a dispute has to be a state. And this was initiated back in 1999 where the Hawaiian Kingdom was a defendant in this case, represented by the Council of Regency against claims of Lance Larson, which I will cover. Now the Permanent Court of Arbitration is an intergovernmental organization that creates ad hoc tribunals to address particular disputes. The PCA has institutional jurisdiction for administrative purposes for the following disputes. Disputes between two states, Here's an example from the Permanent Court of Arbitration's case repository. The Republic of Ecuador versus the United States of America. Well, they had to identify and ensure that Ecuador was a state and the United States was a state. And then from that determination, establish the ad hoc tribunal. The PCA can also hear disputes between a state and an international organization. In this case, Peru versus the United Nations Office for Project Services. In this case, the Permanent Court of Arbitration verified Peru as a state and the United Nations as an international organization. Then the ad hoc tribunal was established. It can also hear a dispute between a state and a private party. In this case, Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. Here it says, Larson, Lance Paul Larson, a resident of Hawaii under case description, brought a claim against the Hawaiian Kingdom by its council of regency on the grounds that the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom is in continual violation of these treaties and certain principles of international law for allowing the unlawful imposition of American municipal laws over the claimant's person, Lance Larson's person, within the territorial jurisdiction of the Hawaiian Kingdom. What's important here is that the Permanent Court of Arbitration, before they created the tribunal to resolve this dispute, this allegation okay, of, of the Council of Regency allowing American law to be imposed, they had to identify that one of the parties was a state where well, they identified Lance Larson as a private entity and the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state, and also acknowledged that the Council of Regency is the government of this Hawaiian Kingdom, which is currently a state. It was, there, it was thereafter that three arbitrators were selected, okay? And two of these arbitrators, Professor Greenwood and Professor Crawford later became judges on the International Court of Justice. Ms. Ninia Parks represented Lance Paul Larson and I represented the Council of Regency's legal team as agent. Now, what I wanna do here is to show a short clip of a uh, uh, proceedings held at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in December of 2000, 21 years ago. Okay. And what you're going to see here is once the Permanent Court of Arbitration verified the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a state, right, which led to the formation of the tribunal, this is what triggered phase two of the Hawaiian Kingdom Council of Regency strategic plan, exposure. And you will begin to see our exposure being done at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in this short clip. Dominion of the Hawaiian Kingdom. In summary, from 1840, the Hawaiian Kingdom possessed a constitutional government with elected and appointed officials and a complete system of civil and criminal laws to govern Hawaiian territory. On April 8, 1842, King Commander III and Privy Council commissions three envoys to secure international recognition of Hawaiian independence. And these individuals are Timoteo Ha'alilio, William Richards and Sir George Simpson. On December 19th, 1842, Hawaiian envoys secured United States President Tyler's recognition of Hawaiian independence. November 28th, 1843, the British government and the French government formally enter into a declaration recognizing Hawaiian independence. In our pleadings, we refer to that as the 1843 Anglo-Franco Proclamation. From that point, Hawaii has 
had its statehood recognized as being independent. As such, it began to enter into these treaties, Austria-Hungary, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Russia, Spain, and the United States of America. International recognition is evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom had diplomatic representatives as of 1893 from those countries, as far as consulates and embassies. Rather, what we find is that the United States has never expressed, it, expressed itself as an occupier. Who would? It would never admit to occupation. But yet, to admit to occupation is, in a sense, to admit to the continued existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state which is really the crux of the matter, which is actually what is holding up, you might say, this issue to be resolved. Thus, the legal order. Thus, the reestablishment of the government. Thus, the relationship between its nationals. I, I mean, to be, to be slightly unkind, but thus the issue in REM. The point is that if the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist, its existence is in REM. It's not in personam of the Hawaiian existence. The, the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist solely in the opinion of Mr. Lars. Right. But that existence should not be dependent upon an occupier because you basically put the occupier at an, on an equal footing with the Hawaiian kingdom in its own territory. So really what needs to be addressed is what came before the occupation, whether the statehood or whether the legality or the illegality of the Hawaiian kingdom, not the illegality or legality of the United States as an occupier. Should the tribunal find it has jurisdiction, we are prepared to submit an offer of proof. We felt that this tribunal would offer some clarity so that for the first time we have a third party to present these type of merits that can be scrutinized by international law rather than taking it before a United States tribunal which could not rule on it to the detriment of itself. So in that sense, there is really no other way to address this issue. And the opportunity did arise because it was Mr. Larson who was adhering to Hawaiian Kingdom law. And if the United States was adhering to occupation, not whether they're illegal or illegal, but if they were adhering to the laws of occupation, we wouldn't be here right now. So this was a very profound move that the Council of Regency was able to be a participant in and to bring to that forum Hawaii's history. People internationally and locally did not realize Hawaii's profound status as a subject of international law. Now, after the case was heard, the American Journal of International Law that provides uh, uh, coverage of recent international court decisions did a story, an article on Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. And according to the American Journal of International Law, it stated at the center of the PCA proceedings was that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist and that the Council of Regency representing the Hawaiian Kingdom is legally responsible under international law for the protection of Hawaiian subjects, including the claimant. In other words, the Hawaiian Kingdom was legally obligated to protect Larson from the United States unlawful imposition over him of its municipal laws through its political subdivision, the state of Hawaii. As a result of this responsibility, Larson submitted, the Hawaiian Council of Regency should be liable for any international law violations that the United States had committed against him. What's important about this commentary made by the American Journal of International Law, its editorial board, it is acknowledging not only the Hawaiian Kingdom's existence as it was a party to these proceedings, but also the responsibility of the Council of Regency toward the local population. And this, the, the, the formation of the Council of Regency was really first to expose Hawaii's status as a country, but more importantly, to look out for the rights and protect those rights of Hawaiian subjects and the permanent population within the Hawaiian kingdom that, uh, that, they are allow, uh, that is allowable under the law of occupation. 
Now, after the last day of the hearing on December 11th in, in, in the Hague, Netherlands, there were three days of hearings. On that last day of the hearing, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Umi Ali Loa Sai, received a call from Ambassador Biho Zagawa. And he was at the permanent court of arbitration where he attended a proceeding across the hall at the International Court of Justice. And this was Congo versus Belgium. And the issue there was whether or not an international, uh, an arrest warrant issued by Brussels against Congo's Minister of Foreign Affairs had any effect beyond Belgian territory. Very similar to whether or not US law has any effect outside of US territory. The decision made in the ICJ was that uh, the, uh, um, the arrest warrant did not have, okay, did not have any effect outside of Belgian territory, even as argued by by the Belgians uh, under necessity and human rights violations. It just showed the limitation of Belgian legislation, and in this case, the Belgian arrest warrant. During that hearing, which was on a Friday, Dr. Bio Zagara was told about Hawaii's arbitration across the hall. And he went to the registry of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which the Council of Regency and Lance Larson's attorney, Ms. Ninia Parks, agreed to be open. Yeah, so other countries could have access to all pleadings and records. So the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Umi Ali Loa, received a call from the ambassador asking if we, the Council of Regency, the legal team of the Hawaiian government, could have a meeting with him in Brussels, Belgium. In this meeting, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Bio Zagawa stated to me that his government in Kigali went over everything and it was clear Hawaii is occupied and this cannot be tolerated. And that Rwanda is asking the Council of Regency in stating that they are prepared to report to the United Nations General Assembly to put it on the agenda, Hawaii's occupation and basically trigger international law to bring compliance. Now that was an important time for us, a very important time where I had to ask the ambassador to be excused so I could speak with my legal team. I returned back to the ambassador and sat in front of him and I said, please convey our sincere gratitude to your president, but we cannot accept this offer. We cannot accept this offer in good conscience because we have to go home and deal with denationalization. Our people back home have no clue of this status that Hawaii has since the 19th century till today. And the rights that they have, especially humanitarian law, rights of civilians, we need to begin re-education. So we needed to address denationalization first. Dr. Bio Zagara, uh, thanked me. I thanked him. The meeting came to an end. We traveled back to The Hague. And at, that, at The Hague, we had a meeting and it was discussed. And that in order to, we felt, effectively engage denationalization, we need to address information, not politics. So looking at the U.S. Army Field Manual, FM 27-10, the law of land warfare, which applies as part of customary law during occupations, remedies for violation of international law called war crimes. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. Publication of the facts with the view to influencing public opinion against the offending, offending belligerent. It was based upon this rule, this customary rule, okay? that it was decided that I would enter the University of Hawaii Political Science Department, enter the graduate program and secure a master's degree specializing in international relations and then a PhD. But more importantly, I will be directly engaging misinformation, but it will be done from an academic standpoint, a scholarly standpoint. And this has led to a plethora of academic publications that address in law review articles, peer review articles, publications, the breadth of Hawaii's status as an independent state and its effect across 
the community, whether economics, nationality or citizenship, land titles, international relations, and so forth. At the core of this research would be analytical rigor, an appropriate theoretical framework that will, be, that will effectively explain Hawaii's situation. The crowning jewel of the Council of Regency was when representatives from the Hawaii State Teachers Association comprised of public school teachers across Hawaii they are an affiliate union member of the National Education Association. In 2017, these teachers who began teaching about Hawaii's occupation within the school system to young men and women from grades one through high school was able to get the assembly of the National Education Association that was meeting in Boston to pass this resolution, quote, the NEA, the National Education Association, will publish an article that documents the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893, the prolonged illegal occupation of the United States in the Hawaiian kingdom, and the harmful effects that this occupation has had on the Hawaiian people and resources of the land. When these delegates re re uh, returned home, uh, I was asked, which I gladly accepted, to write these articles for them, for the NEA to publish. That first article published by, at the website of the NEA was April 2nd, 2018, titled The Illegal Overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom Government. Now you may notice the overthrow was the government, not the Hawaiian Kingdom, which is the state. Later, October, uh, the next article, The U.S. Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom was published. And then later that month, the third and final article, The Impact of the U.S. Occupation on the Hawaiian people. In this article, I specifically address universal health care under Hawaiian kingdom law where native Hawaiians, Aboriginal Hawaiians, have health care free of charge at Queens Hospital and how that was dismantled when America took over in the early 1900s. I also cover in this article denationalization and how that denationalization has radically changed the minds of Hawaii's people today. As a result of this exposure of Hawaii's status as an independent state under a prolonged occupation. In February of 2018, Dr. Alfred Desaias, United Nations independent expert who was appointed as such by the United Nations Human Rights Council, sent a letter to two uh, judges of the state of Hawaii and members of the judiciary. He stated, as a professor of international law, the former secretary of the UN Human Rights Committee co-author of the book, The United Nations Human Rights Committee Case Law, 1977 to 2008, and currently serving as the UN independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order, I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity, but a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions require that governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. What is important here is that this uh, uh, communication by the UN independent expert is not a source of international law, right, as to the rules, but merely this communication is relying on what is international law and stating what is supposed to take place. Now, relating to the elements of war crimes, and this is important because once we began the exposure of Hawaii back in the year 2001 after returning from The Hague, this truth will lead to accountability. But you cannot hold people accountable for war crimes, which are violations, specific violations of international humanitarian law, if they are not aware of the situation. And this is reflected by the International Criminal Court, which addresses certain issues that refer to the last two elements of war crimes, which addresses the awareness aspect, or what would be called the mens rea. 
and the actus reus or the action taken, but it has to be done with intent. What defines intent, right? Well, according to the International uh, Criminal Court, there is no requirement for a legal evaluation by the perpetrator as to the existence of an armed conflict that led to a belligerent occupation. In that context, there is no requirement for awareness by the perpetrator of the facts that establish the character of the armed conflict that led to a belligerent occupation. There is only a requirement for the awareness of the factual circumstances that establish the existence of the armed conflict that led to a belligerent occupation. The National Lawyers Guild letter to the state of Hawaii presents okay, those factual circumstances. After 21 years, okay, well, let's see, I think 2001, after 20 years, this is 2001, after 2021, after 20 years, there is no way that people in Hawaii cannot say that they are not aware of the factual circumstances of Hawaii being occupied. Now, the Council of Regency, as the legitimate organ of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state, despite not having effective power, you know, effective control of territory, it still has what is called police power, which is the exercise of control for the purposes of promoting the general welfare of the country, even when it is occupied by a foreign power. Professor Lanzarini did speak to that aspect of legislation, looking out for the rights of the people or the civilians of Hawaii's occupied territory. This police power is embodied in Article 13 of the 1864 Constitution, where it says the king, a constitutional monarch, in, the case, in this case, the Council of Regency, conducts government for the common good and not for the profit, honor, or private interests of any one man, family, or class of men among his subjects. So again, going back to the laws of war, FM 27-10 under remedies, there is also another remedy here that at the request of a party to the conflict, an inquiry shall be instituted in a matter to be decided between the interested parties concerning any alleged violation of the Geneva Convention, which are grave breaches, as well as customary international law that applies to other war crimes that weren't identified in the Geneva Convention. Also, in the Hawaiian Kingdom, the Council of Regency, there is precedence that the monarch and its office is able to create commissions of inquiry, called Royal Commissions of Inquiry, where they look into situations, provide reports that either affect policy change or legislation. In this case, we're going to establish a Royal Commission of Inquiry to investigate war crimes. So as stated by Professor Lanzarini, the Commission of Inquiry was established on April 17th, 2019, the purpose of the Royal Commission shall be to investigate the consequences of the United States belligerent occupation, including with regard to international law, humanitarian law, and human rights, and the allegations of war crimes committed in that context. Under Article 3 of the proclamation, it says the composition of the Royal Commission shall be decided by the head and shall be comprised of recognized experts in various fields. The Commission of Inquiry has acquired legal opinions from the following experts in international law, which by the way, all come from Europe. Professor Matthew Craven, University of London, SOAS School of Law on the subject of the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state under international law. Professor William Shabos, Middlesex University London School of Law on the subject of the elements of current war crimes committed in the Hawaiian Kingdom and Professor Federico Lanzarini, which you folks have just heard, who, by the way, is also an expert in human rights law. He is from the University of Siena, Italy, Department of Political and International Studies on the subject of human rights violations in the Hawaiian Kingdom and the right of self-determination of Hawaii's population, which is very different from self-determination a, in a colonial situation. Now, war crimes that are currently being committed in Hawaii uh, include, but are not limited to, denationalization, pillaging, unlawful appropriation of property, depriving a protected person of a fair and regular trial. Courts throughout the Hawaii are not properly constituted because they are established under and by virtue of United States law, 
that has no effect within Hawaiian territory, thus rendering these courts not properly constituted. So therefore anyone going through a court proceeding, anything coming out of an illegal court proceeding is not legal, but it does constitute an unfair trial. The question though, for the purposes of criminal culpability on, on the part of the perpetrator who is allegedly committing the war crime of denying a protected person of a fair and regular trial is whether or not that judge or prosecutor or defense attorneys or any perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, is there evidence that they were aware of the factual circumstances that Hawaii was occupied? I can speak to this very clearly that there are a lot of, there are a lot of pleadings that reflect just that under what was called motions to dismiss uh, regarding the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. Also another war crime would be destruction of property. So an example of a destruction of property as a war crime would be the recent events taking place uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom of Mauna Kea on the island of Hawaii. The destruction of property actually would apply to those telescopes that were already built on Mauna Kea without the consent of the Hawaiian government because Mauna Kea sits within what is called the Ahupua of Ka'ohe and the Ahupua of Ka'ohe is government land, part of public lands in the Hawaiian kingdom. So the destruction of that ground in putting those telescopes up constitutes a war crime. Now, whether or not the alleged perpetrator of these war crimes could be prosecuted would go to the mens rea or the question of awareness of these perpetrators that Hawaii was occupied. But I'm pretty sure and I'm convinced that the, 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 the destruction of this property on Mauna Kea and the building of these telescopes were done by people who didn't know. I'm pretty sure of that. Now, after 2001, now it's a different question. Now that question will be applied to the 30, the 30 meter telescope. And I can assure you there is evidence that everybody knew that Hawaii was occupied. And therefore the idea of awareness of mens rea can be met. Also unlawful confinement of a protected person. Okay. Removing protected persons from the country. Uh, prisoners uh, being transferred to prisons in the United States from Hawaii. Those are civilians and they're not supposed to be transferred. That transferring of these uh, prisoners uh, constitutes removing protected persons from the country, which is a war crime. Again, the next question is culpability. Has mens rea been met? Has the intent been met that they knew beforehand before sending these prisoners outside of Hawaiian territory. Now the recent deaths of prisoners in these territories, well, that also constitutes another war crime, death as a result of removing protected persons from the country. And also involuntary conscription or drafting into the US armed forces. So in the case of Vietnam, a lot of Hawaiian subjects were drafted, but at this time though, for the purposes of determining mens rea by the perpetrator, it is not clear, because I found no evidence that back then they knew that Hawaii was occupied and then still drafted. And then these soldiers went to war, which included my uncles, right? So the war crime is one thing. Now, whether or not alleged perpetrators can be culpable or, or, or liable to be prosecuted, that is a completely separate question, right? So we have to discern between what are war crimes that no doubt have been committed and whether or not alleged perpetrators can be prosecuted. Now there is no statute of limitation for those who commit war crimes, which means you may be committing a war crime now. It is clear that you had mens rea, you were aware of the factual circumstances that Hawaii was occupied, but because of the power structure and that you are protected, that doesn't diminish your culpability. In fact, during occupation and international humanitarian law, prosecution for war crimes 
are not time sensitive, meaning there is no rush to prosecute because there is no statute of limitation for those who committed the war crimes, which means, according to Professor Shabas, you could be, you could reach the age of 80 years old and still be prosecuted, no matter where you are in the world. So that is a serious indication. That is an indication of how serious we are now getting into Hawaii's occupation and the application of not just war crimes, but culpability for committing war crimes. States and, and the International Criminal Court are obligated to prosecute individuals who have committed war crimes irrespective of their nationality or the territory where the war crime was committed. So an example in this case would be, let's say the Royal Commission of Inquiry comes out with a report that identifies with evidence certain individuals or an individual who committed a particular war crime. And that individual leaves Hawaii and travels through Switzerland. The Swiss authorities would have that information regarding uh, this, inf this, the evidence of a war crime committed, and it would be the duty and obligation of Swiss officials to detain that individual in Switzerland and prosecute them under universal jurisdiction. That, and that is a, a, a political process that will be determined by Swiss municipal law. But there is the international law as to an obligation because war crimes uh, cannot be committed without violating what is called use cogens or peremptory norm, which is a very high level of international law rule. Uh, they have to prosecute, but as to how they prosecute, each state would be different. Now, every member state that signed the Rome Statute that established the International Criminal Court, they exercise, by agreement in the treaty, they exercise complementary jurisdiction, meaning it is their responsibility as state parties to prosecute, and that the International Criminal Court only prosecutes uh, high value uh, individuals for prosecution. So International Criminal Court does not take away the responsibility of prosecution. It facilitates it. And that stayed in the International uh, Criminal Court's Rome Statute. Now the Royal Commission of Inquiry provides its reports to the Council of Regency, contracting states of the Hague and Geneva Conventions, the International Criminal Court, the International Committee of the Red Cross and the National Lawyers Guild. And as the National Lawyers Guild is a member of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers will also be receiving these reports. Its first task, the commission's first task was to publish an ebook on the formation of the Royal Commission of Inquiry and on certain subjects relating to the Hawaiian Kingdom and its prolonged occupation by the United States. And uh, in January of last year, this book was brought out, the Royal Commission of Inquiry. It's an ebook, accessible free online, investigating war crimes and human rights violations in the Hawaiian Kingdom. It begins with uh, uh, my section on the Royal Commission of Inquiry its basis for uh, its authority. And then chapter one, I am the author of Hawaiian constitutional governance so that people can understand how the Hawaiian kingdom operated as a constitutional system. Also, I authored the second chapter, United States belligerent occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom. The third chapter was authored by Professor Matthew Craven, continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom as a state under international law. Chapter three, authored by Professor William Shabas, War Crimes Related to the United States Belligerent Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, and Chapter 5, uh, authored by Professor Federico Lanzarini on Human Rights Violations and the Right of Self-Determination of Peoples Related to the United States Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. What's also in this book are the proclamations of the Council of Regency, being its legislation. It's the Hawaiian Constitution of 1864 as well, and also all the treaties that the Hawaiian Kingdom has with foreign countries since the 19th century to date, and also international humanitarian law reflected in the Hague and Geneva Conventions. Now the Royal Commission of Inquiry will officially begin, which began by providing preliminary reports on certain subjects in order to bring awareness as to the scope of its investigative authority and the methods of its investigations. What's important here is the Royal Commission of Inquiry is not rushing to do uh, a report on war crimes allegedly to have been committed. This is preliminary and very important that the Royal Commission of Inquiry 
has to, for the sake of awareness, to continue to educate and bring people to know what happened, uh, preliminary reports, Prelimin preliminary reports on certain subjects. This will be ongoing. Uh, the report itself that will be coming out will be in the future, but the Royal Commission of Inquiry is, it, its purpose is to protect our people, protect. And if somebody who committed a war crime can be justified for not knowing or has done something to mitigate the situation that they have created, they would not be subject to a report and a conclusion that a war crime has been committed. So it's very important that people throughout Hawaii, especially within the state of Hawaii and the counties, need to understand the severity of the situation and be careful how to operate, very careful. So the first preliminary report was on the material elements of war crimes and ascertaining the mens rea, all according to international law. The second preliminary report was on the authority of the Council of Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom, should anyone question the authority of the commission's reports. And the third preliminary report was legal status of land titles throughout the realm, which led to a supplemental report on title insurance. As a consequence of the United States deliberate failure to administer the laws of the Hawaiian kingdom, all land titles were incapable of conveyance after the government was illegally overthrown on January 17th, 1893. Land titles in Hawaii originate as early as 1843. And in order to convey title to land, the deed must be notarized by a Hawaiian subject notary and recorded in the Bureau of Conveyance that exists within the Ministry of the Interior, which currently is called the Department of Land and Natural Resources. That Bureau still exists today. Without a valid notary under Hawaiian kingdom law, all land titles and consequently all mortgages are void. I'd like to bring attention to that executive agreement between the queen and the president. The United States president admitted and acknowledged that these individuals in 1893 were not government officials, but an insurgency. That admittance evidenced by the executive agreement would preclude the provisional government from being or serving one of its officers, so-called officers, as a notary, okay? That means there's still an insurgent. That creates a problem in the transference of property because that is not a valid notary to notarize that deed after January 17th, 1893. Now in Gumapak versus Deutsche Bank in 2012, a US federal district court in California found quote, that a title report revealed a defect of title by virtue of an executive agreement between President Grover Cleveland and Queen Lilikwo Kalani of the Hawaiian Kingdom that rendered all notary actions unlawful. Thus, the deed of conveyance to the homeowners was nullified. The federal court also concluded that claimants under both an owner's and lender's insurance policy have, quote, a duty to notify the insurer of any title defects. The one thing about the law of occupation, what is important is the law of occupation, one of its cornerstones is it does not affect private rights in property, okay? It's called vested rights, vested rights of title holders. There is no evidence that the Hawaiian government, okay, allowed government land to be transferred by the provisional government or the Republic, the territory or the state. There is no evidence of that. That means nothing was consented to. International humanitarian law preserves the rights of entities that have rights, private rights in the land, as well as crown lands. Okay? There is no evidence that Queen Lili Ukulani before her passing consented to the transference of land out of what is called the crown land estate, which is over a million acres here in Hawaii. So, this information has garnered the attention of people in Hawaii who have lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic and are not able to make their monthly payments. They are realizing that when they were in escrow, they were required to buy title insurance for the lenders before the lender would accept their mortgage to secure the repayment of the loan. If there is a defect in the title, 
which is in the insurance policy, which renders the mortgage void, the title insurance pays off the remaining balance of the loan if the insurance company is unable to remedy the defect. The Royal Commission of Inquiry has notified the American Land Title Association and the Mortgage Bankers Association of Hawaii that notices of claims of, under both an owner's title insurance policy and a lender's title insurance policy will be filed in accordance with the terms of both policies. State of Hawaii officials are looking into this matter in order to protect borrowers who purchase title insurance to cover their debts owed to the lenders due to the pandemic. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association in the United States, along with New Jersey, Florida, New York, and Nevada, Hawaii will be expecting an explosion of foreclosures because a lot of uh, 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 employment was terminated because it was part of the travel industry, which has been affected by the pandemic. For information on the Royal Commission of Inquiry, please visit this website at hawaiiankingdom.org. At the bottom left, there's a button there called Royal Commission of Inquiry, and you can follow all the information, the updated reports and so forth. To bring this presentation to a conclusion, I would like to finish with these facts regarding internationally wrongful acts. The United States has committed internationally wrongful acts against the Hawaiian Kingdom and its population for over a century. As an international wrongful act, member states of the United Nations have an obligation to not recognize as lawful a situation created by a serious breach of international law, nor render aid or assistance in maintaining that situation. Member states of the United Nations shall cooperate, not may, shall cooperate to bring to an end through lawful means any serious breach of international law. We are here at the stage of a prolonged occupation, but the law of occupation has not been complied with. So the Royal Commission of Inquiry, as an extension of the Council of Regency, understands that once the occupation, the law of occupation is being applied and Hawaiian laws are being administered, we can look at a previous occupation that took place from 1945 to 1952, when General MacArthur was military governor of the occupying government in Japan. So after Japan signed the Treaty of Surrender, which was an overthrow of the Japanese government that did not end the state of war, rather it initiated the law of belligerent occupation where, uh, where the laws of Japan were administered by General MacArthur. And that lasted for seven years until 1951, there was a treaty of peace signed in San Francisco, which took effect in 1952, when the occupation came to an end and the Japanese government stepped into what the occupying government was doing since 1945. We in Hawaii are not at that stage of administering Hawaiian kingdom law. The Royal Commission of Inquiry is addressing uh, issues of violations of the law of occupation in that it wasn't being administered that has led to all these war crimes. The state of Hawaii and the county governments can remedy their situation by bringing themselves into compliance under the laws of occupation. And uh, with that, I'd like to bring this to a close and turn it back to uh, Charlotte. Mahalo. Great, thank you so much to both of you for your extensive presentations. Um, because there have already been um, lengthy presentations today, we'll only have time to take some of the questions. Um, we've received a number of questions, but um, we've we set this up as a two hour event. It's already been longer than that. And we can definitely continue to this conversation, but um, you know, we will have to, uh, we might not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So thank you so much to everyone who has, um, who has submitted questions during the event. We have a number that came in through the chat as well as a number that came in through the Q&A. So uh, once again, thank you uh, for your comments. We've received one question um, that is, asking 
about the rights of nobles and regents in place now in the Hawaiian kingdom, um, because this person wrote that do our current nobles and regents in place have the authority to enforce kingdom law now, because currently that is not happening in Hawaii. You know, I, um, I think I'll give you like three questions of those that have come in and then turn to each of you to go through three questions um, with the points that you wanna make, and then we can take another batch of questions. Um, so that we get to as many of the, the points as possible. The second question, um, we had one for Dr. Lanzarini in particular. Um, do you think that cultural integration um, of a different culture has evolved to be so essential that it's possible to stop the attempts of trying to annex a territory with a different culture as a state of the United States in the case of Hawaii? And the third question is, what is the status of the, the international legitimacy status of the 50th state legislature and agencies. It, it is separate from the federal government. The US Supreme Court said in 2009 that it has immunity from being affected by the apology resolution. The US federal government allows the 50th state entity to run amok with sovereign immunity claims to ignore the will of kingdom descendants. Um, and this person also spoke about environmental and cultural exploitation and destruction taking place in Hawaii. So I just like to turn uh, to both of you to get your answers for those first three questions. I'll go ahead and tackle the first question. Okay, so as far as regents and uh, nobles, um, in order to answer that question, we need to go back to what Hawaiian kingdom law was at that time that it continues to be today. Uh, nobles are appointed by the monarch. Uh, the families are not appointed as nobles. Specifically, individuals are appointed for nobles, as nobles, but those titles are not inheritable. So an example of a noble that was appointed by King Kalakaua, no, I believe not King Kalakaua, but King Lunalilo was a Charles Reed Bishop, okay? Uh, he was a noble. Uh, he was non-Aboriginal, but he was a noble. And when he died, uh, that ended his title. Now, that would apply to any noble that has been appointed. So there are no nobles today that have been appointed. Uh, the Council of Regency uh, could appoint nobles, but practically it can't because when the occupation comes to an end, in order to prepare for the transition to get a complete de jure uh, 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 officials of the Council of Regency and not by necessity, right? Because we were not appointed as ministers by a monarch, which is a requirement to be a cabinet minister. The doctrine of necessity allows uh, an extraordinary case to assume that, or as we say in the army, assume the chain of command in an acting capacity. Okay, that's the doctrine of necessity. Now, when the legislature will be reconvened after the occupation comes to an end, which will be identified in the Treaty of Peace, right, is that the Council of Regency has the authority to reconvene the legislative body, but it can only reconvene members of the representatives. Now, in order to get representatives of the people, there needs to be a registration of voters. There needs to be a census report. There are a lot of preliminary things that have to be done first. Once the representatives are convened, then it's the representatives that we elect by ballot a region, a bona fide region, not an acting region. And that regency will now have the capacity under the Hawaiian constitution to identify nobles and appoint nobles to fill the other offices left vacant in that legislative assembly. So there is that process that is laid out under Hawaiian kingdom law. Now to do that during occupation, is, it, it doesn't take place. It's the occupying power that must administer the laws of the occupied state, not the authorities of the occupied state. Right, and that's there's a different dynamic here that that works within the law itself. So, uh, the only regions that exist would be us, based upon international humanitarian law and acknowledged at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and explained by Professor Lanzarini, and we have not, as an official body, appointed nobles because that would only take place by a bona fide region that has been elected by the legislative body, by the representatives, uh, which we are not at this stage. So this is provisional. This is moving toward compliance, not only international humanitarian law to administer the laws of the occupied state, but also compliance to Hawaiian kingdom law. 
that existed before the occupation. We can turn it over to Federico for the second question or the other question. Mahalo, Keanu, yes. Uh, Charlotte, uh, I have um, an organizational question, if you, if you allow me. Yes. Uh, I have been impressed by the, the huge number of questions we have received. And uh, while Keanu was uh, doing his presentation, I have collected some of them. If you allow me, I can try to provide questions to uh, Num to, to provide answers to a number of these questions. Yes, and, uh, I've been I've been ordering them myself, but if you would like to go ahead and, and answer those questions, please feel free to do so, certainly. No, no, I, I, I can be quite brief because uh, at no, the no, preliminary please, please level- please feel free to address any of the questions that have come in yeah, that have drawn you. your interest or attention, of course. No, I, I have to, to specify that, uh, yes, there are indeed many questions and they're very, intelligent and many very interesting and each of them would deserve much more time that we are able today to devote to them so uh, I'm speaking for myself but I think that more or less it will be the same for Keanu uh, the, the, the the answers that we, we will be able to to provide to this to most of these questions today will be quite superficial quite superficial to some extent because we don't have the necessary time to go into details with them all. Uh, the question that Charlotte referred to was uh, whether cultural integration has evolved to be so essential to have the attempts of trying to annex a territory uh, with a different culture as a state of the United States. Well, for me, this is a very interesting question because uh, cultural rights are one of the, the, the main concerns of my research. And I think that differently from the time when the Hawaiian territory was occupied in the 19th century, today the protection of the cultural identity of a people is an interest which is actually protected by international law. So uh, I think that even though it is an issue that is quite controversial, uh, the, the argument of the cultural integrity or, or the cultural integration, let us say, of a people may actually be an additional one, uh, exact in addition to, to the ones that we heard referred to in our presentations to contrast annexation claims. Um, another question that I, I found particularly interesting uh, is the one concerning whether at the present state of things, it would be possible to submit a claim for the admission of the Hawaiian kingdom as a non-member observer state of the United Nations General Assembly as recently happened with Palestine. Uh, the question is whether is this a feasible approach? <laughs> It is a question very difficult to answer because this clearly is more a political than a legal issue. So under a purely legal point of view, I think it would be possible because as you have heard, there are the legal arguments to support the position that the Hawaiian kingdom continues to be an independent state. But in this case, I repeat, the political consideration is predominant. So it basically depends on the support that such a claim could receive from the international community. Uh, I think, and I also think that Keanu uh, would agree on this point, uh, today times are not yet sufficiently mature uh, to, to have the necessary support by the international community to, 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 to a claim of this kind, even though I, I'm convinced that the situation can change in the near future, especially through awareness racing, which is also promoted by means of events like the one to which we are participating today. Um, uh, another question then, I, I, I think I will pass the, 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 the floor to Keanu because I don't want to take too much time. Uh, that I have found particularly interesting is whether uh, 
I mean, how is it possible to reconcile the, the view that I have presented on the position on Hawaii and the international law with the position of international law in the late 19th century, according to which conquest was a legitimate title to territory? And the, the person ans uh, asking this question uh, made an example referring to Oppenheim, which, who was a very famous authority of international law. In reality, I know very well this position, but it was quite controversial even at the time when it was supported by part of the scholars. And uh, it was not universally shared. And so the situation was already at the time quite controversial. And since it was controversial, it did not allow the United States to consolidate their title on the Hawaiian, King, on the Hawaiian Kingdom territory. So I think that the status of Hawaii remained pending. And what counts today is, as I have mentioned in my presentation, that occupation of a territory by a foreign state cannot be considered lawful if it is not in line with the current rules of international law governing occupation itself, respective of whether or not it might be considered legitimate at the time when the territory concern was occupied. And it actually appears that today the occupation of Hawaii is not consistent with the rules of, of international law concerning military occupation. Uh, I will stop for the moment then, of course, if you wish, I can answer to other questions. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I, I just want to touch a bit off of what Federico just covered and then get into a question that I, that I think I can answer with regard to land titles. So when we speak of, um, of conquests, um, there is a term called debalatio. Debalatio is uh, conquest, not session right, or unilateral taking of state territory. The situation here in Hawaii is that the United States cannot claim conquests by virtue of the Balashio because they admitted that what they did was illegal. It was an unjust war, using that term, which does not give rise to the Balashio, right? So this I cover in the Royal Commission of Inquiry book, and I believe it was Schwarzenberger uh, that, that, that cited that. Because de Bellagio, which is controversial, is legitimately claimed, if can be, if the war is just. What we have in the case of the invasion of the Hawaiian Kingdom, President Cleveland clearly stated it was unjust and moved to restore the queen as a matter of international law. Later, in 1993, the United States Congress passed, another, passed a law that apologized for the overthrow and called it illegal. This, uh, notwithstanding the, the factual statements in the resolution itself, but you have now a second statement 100 years later admitting it was illegal, right? So uh, again, as, for, as, as Professor Lenzeri stated, these are issues that get very technical, uh, uh, very technical, and, and they, they are very complex. But in the ebook, I do cover this stuff. And also Professor Lanzarini covers it in, from a human rights standpoint. So I encourage everyone to, to, to get a copy of the ebook and also the preliminary reports. Now, now with that, I wanted to ask, answer this question, which is can the acting council of regency issue royal patents to native tenants during the occupation in accordance with Hawaiian law? Uh, the simple answer is yes, it can. Okay. Now in the preliminary report, on the current legal status of land titles in Hawaii, it does explain why land titles were not capable of transferring after 1893, whether crown lands, government lands, or private lands as a result of a defective notary. But it also gets into prescriptive measures. How do you fix that? So the Council of Regency is looking at the situation here in Hawaii, 100 years of violations. It, it's very complicated and complex, but but the Council of Regency's job is not to exacerbate the problems. It's to provide solutions for the local population and provide a transition into applying the law of occupation, which would ultimately, ultimately lead to the end of the occupation. So, so I would recommend uh, go to the Royal Commission of Inquiries website and download the preliminary report on legal status of land titles in Hawaii, as well as 
uh, the supplemental report on title insurance. So the, the, the Royal Commission of Inquiries website is also a hub to learn. Yeah. And I, I like to think of the book that I edited with Professor Lanzarini's chapter. I like to call it a, a, a one-stop shop of what people need to know about Hawaii, <laughs> uh, whether human rights, war crimes, humanitarian law, continuity, uh, Hawaii's history, constitutionalism. Uh, that really is that book. And I highly recommend people please download it and make that as uh, mandatory. Uh, but, but, but make, it, it, it is technical, right? It is legal, but don't, don't be discouraged. Make sure you have a dictionary if you need to use one to look up certain words <laughs> like the <Balashio. laughs> I'll turn it back to uh, Charlotte. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think we'll just take um, one, uh, you know, before we go into sets of questions, I, Prof uh, Professor Lanzarini, you mentioned that you had actually um, seen some questions that you wanted to answer. So I think it would be great if you answered those questions that you want to answer first, and then we can go back and if we have more time, um, you know, go back into the group of questions that are there. Thank you, Charlotte, you're very kind. Yes, I have picked some of them, especially uh, those that uh, are more concerned with international law issues. Then I have seen that there are many questions concerning the constitutional law of Hawaii. And I think that Keanu is uh, much more competent than me uh, to, to answer those questions. Uh, yes, so I will follow your suggestion. Uh, there is an interesting question concerning, I mean, I'm going to read it. Uh, what if the majority or half of the population of the occupied nation, in our case, Hawaii, uh, would support the illegal occupation and prefer or vote to be citizens of the occupied nation, in our case, the United States, and also support or vote for native subjects to become a federally recognized tribe by US, or which is, in my opinion, a different situation. The occupying government forces the Hawaiian people to become a part of a federally recognized tribe. Is this a war crime? Uh, now, this question, in my opinion, refers to two different situations. Uh, in the event that uh, a people is forced to become part of a, an occupying state. Of course, this is a war crime and there is no legitimacy in the occupation. Uh, another situation is when uh, the majority of the, of the people of a given territory support the occupying power. Here, again, uh, the only possibility today is to provide a quite superficial answer. Uh, a issue of self-determination would arise, and um, Keanu has just suggested to, to download the ebook, and the, the problem of self-determination is explained there as well. But uh, what I can say is that supposing that the majority of the population would clearly and voluntarily support the occupying power, then we, we could conclude that the latter could legitimately acquire sovereignty over the, the occupied territory, even though, of course, this is a very general conclusion and it, it would need to be discussed in light of the specific circumstances of each different situation. In any event, uh, at least as far as I know, it appears that this is not definitely the case of Hawaii. And um, uh, another question, that I have picked uh, concerns the desecration of the Iwi Kapuna Fall, uh, whether it falls, uh, the, the Iwi Kapuna, no, uh, fall is the verb, sorry, I, I thought it was the name of the site. Um, uh, I have checked what Iwi Kapuna is, and I have seen that for the Hawaiian people is, uh, a cultural site of huge importance, of huge spiritual importance. So does the desecration of this site fall under the war crime of destruction of property? Uh, 
uh, not only under the war crime of destruction of property, but uh, it would even fall within a war crime, which according to recent practice is considered even more serious than destruction of property. That is destruction of a particular category of property, uh, specifically destruction of cultural heritage. Uh, the uh, International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia even recognized that destruction of cultural property, uh, especially cultural heritage, can be considered as a crime against humanity. But um, this can be controversial, but for sure it is a war crime. And again, I repeat, even more serious than the war, than the war crime of destruction of property. Then the, there was a question which in reality was addressed to uh, Dr. Keanu Sai, but I would like to say something about that. Uh, it's about the applicability of the principle of universal jurisdiction that Dr. Sai rightly mentioned and explained. Um, the question is, uh, what happens if the United States has not ratified the, the Treaty of Rome establishing, I suppose the question refers to the treaty establishing the International Criminal Court. And so the United States has not accepted the, the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and also of other international institutions with the competence in this field. Uh, in reality, this is not a problem because when we talk about the principle of universal jurisdiction, we refer to a competence which is vested on uh, domestic tribunals. And it is a competence existing under customary international law. So it goes beyond ratification on, of any treaty uh, existing at the international level. So each state has the possibility through its criminal courts to prosecute the authors of war crimes on the only conditions that these persons are physically present on their territory. The main problem with universal jurisdiction is that uh, even though there are different views on this point as well, but according to the way in which it is commonly applied, and by the way, we don't have many examples in the practice of application of the universal jurisdiction. Uh, this principle, this rule is not the source of an obligation for the state, but rather the source of a right. So the courts of a state can decide freely whether or not they want to prosecute a person who is allegedly author of a war crime. That is the main problem. And another problem is the fact that most domestic courts are quite reluctant to prosecute authors of war crimes on the basis of universal jurisdiction, unless they, they have this title of jurisdiction established within their domestic law, which is a situation that is not very frequent. But in principle, uh, the application of universal jurisdiction exists as a matter of customary international law. So it, it does not depend on the ratification of any treaty. I will stop here for the moment. Thank you. And if I can uh, address an important point that people have brought up uh, outside of this, this webinar, um, the rights of protected persons, um, civilians in occupied territory. Now, as Federico explained about the domestic aspects of whether or not governments will prosecute or not prosecute, uh, it is interesting to note that each country has its own criminal code. And what is really interesting is a very progressive aspect of the criminal code of Switzerland regarding war crimes actually brings it as an obligation that the attorney general will initiate. They do a report and that report is even subject to appeal you know, in an administrative capacity. So uh, Germany has something like that, but not as much, but each country is different. And that's why what's important about international law, international law is between countries. Municipal law is within countries. So they work, they work interchangeably. And, and we need to understand that it's not just universal as the term is stated it's 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 an issue it's 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 
it's an obligation to ensure that war crimes are not committed because it's a, a peremptory norm. But as far as the prosecution, then we get into the domestic aspect of bringing people to justice. Now, the Royal Commission of Inquiry is not concerned in trying to change the criminal code of other countries, right? Our concern is the civilian population and what is happening here. Because the obligation of an occupying government, once the state of Hawaii transforms itself under international law, they are responsible for prosecuting war crimes, not another country. It's only when countries exercise universal jurisdiction, there needs to be a reason that the, the state that the crime was committed, they're not doing anything, right? Well, we're not answering that question yet because we're still dealing with prolonged occupation and people are just starting to understand what is international law and how it applies. So we wanna make sure that that educational aspect is important, but also keep in mind that no matter whether or not in a time span that individuals are not prosecuted, there is still no statute of limitation on the commission of war crimes. That's important. So uh, case in point, let's say a Nazi uh, guard at Auschwitz in 1941 was told by let's say a French prisoner, uh, you're gonna be prosecuted for war crimes. That guard would probably laugh and say, no, uh, we're in control. Uh, it, it, we're the third Reich. Well, that confidence clearly was diminished in 1945, which led to the Nuremberg trials and also other countries prosecuting individuals for war crimes in France, in Luxembourg and so forth, right? So again, prosecution is, it's not time sensitive and the, and the commission of inquiry is not trying to push for prosecution because the people that we have here in the state of Hawaii are our own family and friends. We have to keep that in mind. These are not the insurgents of 1893, like Sanford Dole and Samuel Damon. This is, this is our own people. I mean, I serve as an officer in the Hawaii Army National Guard, which used to be called the King's Guard. In 1893, they just changed the name to the National Guard. By serving in the, in the military, I did not commit treason against the Hawaiian kingdom. I had no idea the kingdom even existed, <laughs> right? I was a product of denationalization. But as we begin to be aware of Hawaii's occupation, okay, now we're starting to fulfill the elements of war crimes of culpability, not necessarily driving for prosecution. But we're very careful at the commission, with the commission of inquiry to not name names until you give everyone everyone the benefit of making amends to, because the key here is to comply. And that is important, right? This is not about walking around with a sledgehammer and hitting people on the head. No, this is looking at our the future of our country. And education was used as a weapon to denationalize. We need to reinvoke education, which was the purpose of entering the university, to address that denationalization and don't weaponize it, but bring it in for what it's supposed to be, awareness, knowledge, critical thinking, asking the right questions. That is fundamental in righting the wrong. But the Council of Regency also knows that it does have the police power and it has a duty to protect the people of Hawaii. So getting into the protected persons definition. So protected persons under the Fourth Geneva Convention a person has rights under the Fourth Geneva Convention if they are a protected person, okay? That's important. Now, what is a protected person? So a protected person basically is a national, a national of a country other than a national of the occupying state. That's the Fourth Geneva Convention. So Hawaiian subjects, okay? Uh, French citizens, Japanese citizens, under the Geneva Convention are protected persons, but Americans are not, they're not under the Geneva Convention, but there was a change in international criminal law <clears throat> by the uh, International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia in what is called the Tadic case. And I covered this in the Royal Commission of Inquiry. And in that case, Tadic was a war criminal, but the people that he committed, the, allegedly committed the crimes against was they were both of the same nationality. They were both Yugoslavian citizens. So at first, uh, the appeals court rejected the war crimes that Tadic allegedly committed because 
you can only commit a war crime against a protected person, right? On a further appeal, they determined that it wasn't nationality that is the key, but rather allegiance, the location of where the crime was committed. So those individuals that were the victims of Tadic war crimes owed allegiance to another entity and not to Tadic and his government. And then the war crimes were, charges were reinstituted. That's important because that means under international criminal law, not the Geneva Convention, but international criminal law, American citizens who are not members of the US government or its agencies are protected persons as well. So, so the idea of being protected is important, but also it ties not just to nationality or citizenship, but also allegiance, because everyone within the Hawaiian kingdom owes allegiance to the Hawaiian kingdom during their temporary residence, right? And that means subject to the laws. So one thing that I wanna just finish with in, 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 in tying this up with the nationality issue. I've been asked many times, who are Hawaiian subjects? And that is a term that refers to what is called Hawaiian nationality. So Hawaiian subjects like British subjects, right? Who are Hawaiian subjects? Not Hawaiian citizens, Hawaiian subjects. Well, under Hawaiian kingdom law, there are three ways uh, under its municipal law to acquire Hawaiian citizenship. Uh, one is birth on the soil, okay, which is you soli, it's a Latin term, birth on the soil. That's called natural born citizenship. So in the case of Hawaii's history, Sanford Dole and Samuel Damon were natural born Hawaiian subjects. Their parents were American, but they were, became Hawaiian subjects by birth. That's natural born. You can also become a Hawaiian subject by parentage, you sanguinis. And that's when Hawaiian subjects travel abroad. And let's say they're in San Francisco, uh, a Hawaiian couple, Hawaiian subjects, right? Remember that's not ethnicity, that's nationality. And they give birth to a child in San Francisco. That child under American law is natural born. So that child is an American citizen by birth, but a Hawaiian subject by parentage. That's a dual citizen. And that's called you sanguinis. The third way to acquire Hawaiian citizenship okay, would be through naturalization. You can apply to the Minister of the Interior and with residency of, I believe it was five years uh, achieved, you could get Hawaiian citizenship. Now that is Hawaiian law, right? Very similar to American law and other countries as well. But the law of occupation, its primary purpose in its regulations is to preserve the status quo of the occupied state, its people, its territory, and its institutions. Preserve the status quo. So in order to preserve the status quo, international law precludes people from acquiring the citizenship of an occupied territory by being born on that territory through natural born citizenship, right? They preclude that. And then they also preclude naturalization because that's not the lawful government. So it cannot grant citizenship. They only recognize the acquisition of citizenship of occupied states through use sanguinis, parentage. So in the case of Hawaii, anyone, irrespective of race, color, creed, if they are a direct descendant of someone who was a Hawaiian subject in 1893, they are a Hawaiian subject today. That's how it works. You don't need an affidavit. You just need to show proof of lineage, right? Where the birth certificates and so forth. Now, for anybody who was born in the Hawaiian kingdom before 1893, January 17th, but let's say they were Americans and their mother, uh, this woman gave birth at Queens Hospital in Honolulu on January 16th. That child is a Hawaiian subject by, by being natural born, but also an American citizen by parentage. So that's a dual citizen. And if that person, that family travels back to America, did you know that the descendants of that natural born Hawaiian subject who may still live in America, they have Hawaiian nationality. They may not be domiciled in the Hawaiian kingdom, but they have Hawaiian nationality unless Hawaiian law, municipal law provides how you may lose that nationality. Like in the United States, there are provisions of how Americans can lose their nationality when they're outside of US territory. That's a domestic law question. That's not international law. 
But the Hawaiian kingdom didn't have that. So the nationality of the Hawaiian kingdom, the majority are Aboriginal Hawaiians, right? That's the majority for sure. Despite the migrations of non-Hawaiian subjects to the islands, they're aliens, they're not Hawaiian subjects. But under international law, they're also protected persons. And these are the things that are covered in the book. And I, again, I wanna encourage people to download it and, and please go ahead and read it as well as the reports and, and other issues. Yeah. I'll give it back to Charlotte. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we wanna wrap this up by 3 p.m. our time here. That'll be a three hour webinar, um, especially in terms of having this video to record and watch later. Um, as you said, there have been literally dozens of questions that have come in. Um, if you would like to ask, ask your question, it hasn't been asked as part of the session, um, please email hawaiiankingdom at nlginternational.org. This is an email address that will forward to uh, Dr. Sai and the other co-chairs of the Hawaiian Kingdom subcommittee um, and, and to, to ask further questions. And of course, the, um, the Hawaiian Kingdom website that um, he posted is, is another great resource and you can also uh, make contact through that website as well. Um, I just want to ask, I want to ask both uh, participants to make any final comments that you'd like to make before we close for the day. And also, I mean, there are several questions about different Hawaiian constitutions in order in the, uh, in the 19th century and the validity of these different constitutions and their impact on, um, you know, efforts to end U.S. occupation of Hawaii. There are multiple uh, and there are multiple questions regarding, and these are these are the questions that are coming in through the Q&A box. There are also multiple questions about uh, the possibility of the Hawaiian Kingdom seeking some form of non-member state representation through UN bodies of various kinds, as well as um, questions regarding you know, what's happening in US politics and how that might affect the situation of, of Hawaiians, including efforts to push for this idea of, of Hawaiians becoming a federally recognized uh, tribe rather than working to, to end occupation. So these are just various questions that have come in. I, if you may feel free to address them or to not address them and to focus on um, any other comments that you would like to make um, in, your, in your closing remarks. And once again, thank you to um, Professor Lanzarini. Thank you to Dr. Sai for your very insightful comments. And thank you to all of the many attendees who have stayed throughout this, uh, this session and have been so engaged with the work that is taking place. So um, it, please, uh, Professor Lanzarini. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, about the questions that you, you have referred to right now, um, I repeat that I think that Keanu is much more competent than me because we're talking about Hawaiian constitutional law and especially the, the and also the relationship of Hawaiian law with the US law. Uh, so I would leave him the, the, the answer to this question. Uh, as a conclusion, what I can say is that uh, in many of your questions, we can see that uh, you rightly denounce the practical difficulties and in concretely realizing the legal principles that we are talking about. And these difficulties really exist. Uh, I'm very aware of that and Dr. Tsai is uh, more aware than me about this problem. Uh, this is a reality which is common to international law generally, generally speaking. Uh, uh, at the moment when legal rules are created, unfortunately, it does not mean that these rules are immediately applied in the real world because the international community has to accept that a given situation, which in the mind of many governments was consolidated, will have to change. And this is what actually happens with the situation of the Hawaiian kingdom. When I was involved in the struggle 
for the recovery of the independence of the Hawaiian kingdom a few years ago, uh, I have to confess that I was quite ignorant about the, the situation existing in Hawaii. And when I, I became aware of that, I was immediately very enthusiastic uh, about the possibility of trying to give a contribution to the struggle uh, as as little it may be. Uh, uh, the, the road to, to reach the goal is very long and is very difficult. Uh, we need time. There are many obstacles. There are many political considerations, which unfortunately, in concrete terms, conflict with the legal reality, which unfortunately, uh, to a large extent, remains theoretical. But in these few years, I have seen that things have really changed, especially thanks to uh, Dr. Tsai and to the, the, the other people struggling for the rights of the Hawaiian people. And uh, even though the, the goal is still very far uh, from being reached, but we can see it a little bit clearer at the horizon than a few years ago, especially thanks to the fact that uh, an awareness by the international community has increased concerning the situation of Hawaii. So it is important not to give up in the struggle and it is important to, to promote more and more this awareness because uh, differently from a few years ago, uh, at least at the moment, the struggle of the Hawaiian kingdom uh, is accompanied by the, 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 um, the action, I would say, as Dr. Kianusai has exemplified in his presentation of some countries which have become aware of the situation and now they are supporting the struggle of the Hawaiian kingdom. At the moment, and there are some questions about this point as well, whether it is possible through the support of other countries to obtain, for instance, a given status before international organizations. Probably not at the moment because the countries supporting the Hawaiian kingdom are still today a very limited number, but they're increasing year after year. And we can imagine that in the near future, the situation will be different because what is now the support coming from a limited number of countries can become a general support. And what is important is all the actors involved do not give up to this, okay? They, everybody can give their contribution depending on their own positions. And it is important to continue to do that. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd just like to turn it over to Dr. Sai for your final words of today. Okay. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Federico. It, it is a very complicated issue, but I have to admit that what people knew back in 2001 when we returned from the Netherlands was not that much. But within the last 20 years, because this information and exposure has been institutionalized within the academic world, that is how it's reaching people. Um, in fact, I'm currently working on a chapter. I signed a contract with Oxford University Press, a book called Non-European Powers in the Age of Empire. And this chapter is gonna be covering the Hawaiian kingdom, <laughs> you know, what it was. And that, that's an important move from an academic standpoint, right? But along the lines of education, I cannot stress enough how important education is. And for people not for people to say things that they don't know, I would suggest don't say it because what you say could be used against you because now we're getting into the legality or the consequences of it. It's not just, I'm expressing my opinion. If that opinion leads to a violation of international law that creates a war, war crime victim, see that takes on another level. And that, that is what we have to be careful of, right? Now, how do we in the Council of Regency and the Royal Commission of Inquiry address this issue, this monolith 
right? And we're dealing with over 100 years of brainwashing, which I believe we've cracked it and it's starting to crumble. But the question is, now what? Where do we go from here? Well, we have to understand that it is a process and it has to be done right. It cannot be done to prove somebody right. No, it's either right or it's wrong. It's either legal or it's illegal. It's either a fact or it's not a fact. Let's start working from that premise. And we found that what underlies the politics of power is economics, political economy, private property, that is an impact that would force people to comply because they now have a vested interest in fixing the problem if it is proven they don't own the land, right? They don't have an asset that they thought they had. Also looking at what was the Hawaiian kingdom before the occupation and not what you want the Hawaiian kingdom to be because what you want it to be would stem from what you have led, been led to believe through Americanization. Uh, case in point about the Hawaiian kingdom. What are the benefits of this country? Which we just have to look at the past. Aboriginal Hawaiians had universal health care free of charge. Kapiolani Hospital, Queens Hospital at no charge. Legislature appropriates monies, right, to that. It was a quasi public hospital. That's unheard of in the United States. That's Hawaii already had. Hawaii had universal health care before the Nordic countries after World War II, right? That's important. Hawaii also had um, an understanding of education and high schools and colleges. Oh, we had a study abroad program where we actually sent Hawaiian young men and women to Italy. And they, one of them attended the military academy of Italy, Robert Wilcox. And he became a field artillery officer coming back home. So Hawaii also had free trade. Also, Hawaii did not pay exorbitant taxes, exorbitant taxes like federal taxes. So federal taxes of the United States being applied to people in Hawaii is actually a form of pillaging. That's a war crime because that American law cannot be applied here, right? So what would you pay for taxes here? You would pay for what would be constituted as the occupying government, state of Hawaii, but you would keep that money that would otherwise be given to the federal government. That means you have more money which means you have more money to spend. Thus, you contribute to Hawaii's political economy. The law of occupation takes all of that into consideration. This is not just saying the laws have to be administered. It's more than just the laws. It's the administrative policies. It's case law. It's, it's Hawaiian national consciousness, right? So all of these come into play and that's part of a transition, but it begins with the fact that we have to be correct in how we identify certain things. Hawaii is not a colony. It was never colonized by the United States because that's implying we're not a state. No, Hawaii is occupied, right? There's no settler colonialism here with migrants. No, no, that's called unlawful migration of nationals of an occupier to the occupied state like Israelis into Palestinian territory. That's not colonization of Palestinian territory. That's the war crime of moving a population. So the terminology, we have to be careful, um, but I, I really want to thank Charlotte and the National Lawyers Guild and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers to, to allow this to have taken place and give a forum for myself and Federico to speak on these very important issues. And I know that the audience here is international as well, not just local. And I appreciate that. I even saw a, a comment in the chat uh, somebody was tuning in from Somalia. Awesome. That is great. You know, so we also want to work with the National Lawyers Guild and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers to now take it to another level. Right. And it's really getting that exposure up and the aspects of accountability. So we're still in phase two, the Royal Commission of Inquiry, but it is still truth, but also accountability. And that is a delicate balance that we need to be mindful of. Because you remember, we are all here. We're not the culprits of 1893, right? They've all passed. And a crime is not inheritable, only stolen property. So we can't hold individuals for a crime, but they might have property that's not theirs. How can they take certain steps to mitigate the situation in order to remedy? So no longer is the Hawaiian kingdom as a state going to be compromised anymore. It is strong, and it is strong based upon its constitutional system and its rule of law.
even in the face of the politics of power. And that's important for me as a message to give to everyone as a member of the Council of Regency and head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. Mahalo. Uh, thank you so much to both of today's speakers for your incredibly extensive knowledge and presentations. And thank you again to all of the participants who attended today's event. Once again, the video will be posted and we will send out a link to everyone who attended and everyone who registered, um, and, as well as to the membership of our organizations, inviting them to watch the video on YouTube, on Facebook, and on our websites. Uh, once again, thank you to all and um, have an excellent day and uh, long live the, the people of Hawaii and their uh, legitimate and, and their legitimate rights. Take care.